Vic just won't ask any questions, that's all. Okay, everybody, we're going to get started now. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Because we're, we're dealing with a shortage of mics, so I want to make sure that even though it's stretched over here, obviously everybody's going to have to share. All right, so I hereby call the Des Moines City Council meeting to order as a study session for March 2nd. With that, I'm going to have Councilmember Oxiger lead us, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And thank you for turning on the mics. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. I'm um, going to take a moment to, to make an announcement. Um, we will be restarting the Citizens Advisory Committee. For the month of March, we will be accepting applications. Um, Bonnie's going to be posting that on all the webs the website and, and share it out to the Facebook pages, et cetera, tomorrow. Um, basically, it'll go through the month, and then a recommendations will be put forth before the council for approval on the first regular meeting of April, which will be April 13th. And now, before we get into the meeting, I want to talk a little bit about this meeting and what type of meeting it is. This is the first of two parts of meeting. Primarily, the city manager and staff will be giving us a status of where they are and so forth, what they're trying to achieve this year, and let us assess all those things so we have a full understanding as a council and the public does of what our city's trying to achieve. And then, obviously, we'll reconvene at the next study session in April to discuss discuss some possibilities, if there's something particular councils or council members are championing and so forth, we might have to make hard decisions about what goes and what stays in those types of uh, decision making. This, this particular presentation has about 80 slides. So what I'm going to ask council to do is after each section is presented, I'll do one round of questions and we'll go to the next section, same thing, and at the end everybody will have an opportunity to follow up at the end. So with that, um, are there any correspondence? Probably not for this meeting. No, Mayor. All right. Uh, it'll be now time for public comment. Uh, comments from the public must be limited to the items of business of the study session agenda per Council Rule 10. And uh, before we take comments be from the public, I would like just like to remind those participants that any person making personal, impertinent, or slanderous remarks or who becomes boisterous, threatening, or personally abusive while addressing the Council will be removed from the meeting. When it is your time to speak, you may turn the, you, you'll have three minutes to speak, and we only have one tonight. Um, Mr. Emery, you have the floor, sir. Good evening, everybody. Um, again, I'm David Emery. I'm a resident of the Des Moines Redondo neighborhood. Uh, I'm addressing the council this evening just on, of my, as a private citizen. I'd like to start by thanking the council for your efforts at public uh, engagement over the last few months. I understand that holding public forums and presentations over the past few years have been seriously hampered by the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been really grateful to see these type of events reemerge now that the lockdowns have come to an end. Uh, despite some of the uh, going back and forth on the social media, I personally found those last two public events regarding the marina development uh, to be both informative and helpful opportunity uh, to voice my opinion on the evolving plans. The recent public neighborhood meetings put on by the mayor, uh, the deputy mayor, uh, police chief, and other city officials have also provided a really great opportunity for the type of two-way engagement uh, that we've been missing for a while now. Uh, as you all are working through your planning this evening and moving forward, I'd like to encourage you to keep on the top of your minds the need for public engagement both commuting, communicating out information to the public and taking in information and feedback from the public. In particular, um, I'm delighted to hear that the council uh, is restarting the Citizens Advisory Committee after the last several years. Um, I would encourage you to consider convening other advisory committees for specific capital projects, uh, such as the marina development and the capital improvements that are planned for down in the Redondo Beach area. It seems to me that we have a lot of residents who are not only passionate and interested in helping with public engagement, 
uh, but that these individuals also have professional and life experiences that could help improve final decision making by the city. Uh, thank you for keeping public engagement on, in your minds during your planning discussions this evening. Thank you, Mr. Emery. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to our city manager, Michael Mathias. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Just a brief recap of kind of the context of what we're doing tonight. Um, this is, as most people are aware, what's called a council manager form of government. And what that means is that the role of the city council is primarily to, as a group, and voting from their role within that group, is to pass ordinances, establish public policy, pass budgets, and appoint and re release city managers. And that's the role of the council in this form of government. The implementation the admin of, of the policies, the functioning of the government as a whole, the ongoing um, addressing of problems, the allocation of resources recommended to the council in the budget are all the responsibility of our city administration. So this is an opportunity um, following on the budget retreat from last year to walk through with the council the responsibilities of our government. And I think there's a couple of things that I'll say in the beginning and then you can test the truth of this. We have beyond question an outstanding staff. Every single person that's gonna present tonight is a positive reflection of this community in terms of accomplishing goals and accomplishing work and working for our city. Um, so that's, you know, as I say, every morning I wake up and I have the pleasure of driving to work knowing I get to work with all of you. And that's, that's always inspiring to me and always makes up for some of the negatives that come with this job. Um, so with that, what we're gonna do is a series of presentations tonight. And the idea is that, you know, council has interests in certain things occurring, and they need four votes to direct us to do that, those things, and that's fine. But we're, you know, the, the idea is that we are very close to saturation point in terms of responsibilities. And so what we want to impress upon the city council in this presentation and share with the public is that anything you ask us to do really needs to come in replacement of something we're already doing because the glass is full. And I think um, uh, it's hard to give him credit. It's always hard, I can barely say the words, but Council Member Pennington, I think, said it best. And that was that as we go through um, establishing what to do, saying that we can do more with less is the wrong answer. We can do more with less for certain periods of time, occasionally. That cannot be a chronic feature of work at this city because we're gonna lose people. And um, like I said last week, talking about this somewhat, we want to make sure that the people that drive heavy vehicles, people that are out you know, working long hours, PD, everybody else, that they are rested, happy, see time off with their families, and we do not just put them in a position of having to chronically produce. I mean, that happens during snowstorms. It can't be the rule of the, day, of the day. So, Vic, that was the mantra, and we thank you for that and for understanding that based on your many, many years of public service. So, the thing is that over um, the past four years, we have emphasized in budget retreats the whole concept of succession planning. And we've identified where succession planning would be important and, and how to address that. And that's now happening. We're seeing a significant transition in senior staff and some other staff occasionally. And we want to be in a position where we can pick that up. And so I think that there are some people that are new to the process, some new directors. Um, they're working hard to kind of get up to speed to understand our culture. Our culture is very inclusive. We want everybody's input. I want everyone's input. We don't hold anyone accountable for, you know, it's more if you don't give input than if you give what could be considered bad input, which there really isn't any bad input because from that we derive 
what our approach and policies and actions will be. So um, as you can see, and I'm sorry, you guys feel free to turn around and we, don't, we won't take it first if you have your backs to it. Um, but over the past four years or so, we've consistently, as I said, been reviewing this. And this was especially the case as it related to COVID. So we've just gone through almost at least three years of COVID. And COVID changed the dynamic of how the government functioned because the governor issued um, a proclamation, an emergency proclamation, as did the city, allowing um, decisions to be made by the city manager in advance of council approval or in advance of council allocation of resources because the assumption by the governor and by emergency management planning is that the city manager would act in the interest of the city. And that was the legitimizing um, basis for this. So we'll see both the impacts and result of our succession planning and bringing council back up to speed. The emergency proclamation has now been rescinded. We're back to relative normal and um, we are going to use this opportunity tonight to literally report to council what our activities in the city are. So with that, we'll start with, oh, surprisingly, let's start the city manager's office. So this is essentially, you can see on the left functionality, city clerk reports to city manager, as does chief administrative officer. Um, we have a public records analyst. We have a city hall office specialist who assists in various tasks especially um, business licenses. And um, Councilmember Steinmetz, I think you brought that up at one point. It would be helpful to see the business licenses, um, what the status is. So we're planning to do that in the future and bring that to council on a periodic basis so you can kind of see the activity in the, in the city. Um, C Manager's team, uh, this has evolved somewhat from a slightly smaller executive team, but essentially our city attorney, and as I go through these, you know, every one of these are held by exceptional people. It's amazing. But our city attorney, our police chief, finance director, chief administrative officer, who is Bonnie, um, the judge, the court, public works director, Andrew is relatively new at this and um, working hard. I think yesterday was a wonderful testimony to the quality of work that Andrew can accomplish um, with the bulkhead. The community development director, and that's Denise. Um, Laura sitting in for her, and Laura is just doing a fantastic job as well. We have, you know, Harbor Master couldn't ask for a better um, Harbor Master than Scott, and what Katie's doing there. Human Resources Director AJ and Shauna, who were slowly schooling on basketball choices. Um, <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Mirror's all behind that, too. Um, emergency management preparedness. Shannon has just done an amazing job. And our Parks and Recreation Senior Services. Nicole has been out for a bit, but Kyle has been filling in. And one thing about Kyle, it's great to meet with him because all you get is enthusiasm. And it's contagious. So he leaves, and then I'm enthusiastic the rest of the day, man. He gets to <laughs> so anyways. Okay, so... What does city manager do, essentially? This is just a portion of it, but manage the city government, implement policy directives from the council. We're also responsible uh, for preparing for council what potential policy directives um, you know, could be uh, approved and what the consequences of those are and what the alternatives are as, as we go through that. We have to assure, and my job, along with Jeff, um, who's our finance director, Jeff, sorry I didn't introduce you, but um, is assure solvency and stability in the city budget, which happily we, for the last six years, after facing um, the potential bankruptcy, and I know that Councilmember Pennington and Councilmember Nutting remember those days, um, that we've emerged, and we've emerged strong. Um, work with city department directors. For me, my style, it's more a partnership than it is autocratic. We um, are responsible for maintaining external relationships I'll talk more about in a minute. We approve contracts, seek grant opportunities, contracts exceeding $50,000 we bring to city council, we provide leadership for economic development, which is uh, a, a function of what my background and ability is, 
and then we manage extraordinary circumstances, for example, COVID. Once again, knocking on any available wood, we emerged from COVID without fatalities. And that's quite an extraordinary accomplishment from our, for our city family and to the degree we're able to minimize that working with community partners. Okay. So briefly, participation external agencies. And the idea is that all this takes time, right? So I'm on the board of SCORE, on the administrative board, that's decision making. Um, our finance director is on the finance committee. The police chief has been involved with the operations committee. And we meet monthly or bi-monthly, depending, and, and manage SCORE along with SIT. We had seven owner cities, Federal Way withdrew, and we uh, uh, are now down to six. But I'll tell you a quick story about SCORE, was that when SCORE started, the city was, along with the other cities, there were going to be bonds issued. And what happened was that our bond rating was so low that we were going to dilute the pool and cost everybody more money. So we became designated as a host city because it's located in Des Moines. But we did not participate in the bond payments. Although we, we helped pay off the principal, we were not officially in the bond documents. Recently, with Federal Way leaving, all the bonds for SCORE were refinanced. And this time, based on the fact that we received a three-step bond upgrade from Standard & Poor's AA Plus, at the meeting with the Bond Council, it turned out the city of Des Moines hit the highest bond rating of anybody in the room. And so now, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and so for now, what happened now is instead of diluting the value, we raised what the value of the bonds were and reduced the cost. So that, that, but that's score. So that's just one activity that takes a lot of time and energy. Working also with START, I attend, there's a coordination meeting that we have strategic before those meetings, city managers meet with the leadership at the airport and establish what the agendas are gonna be in discussions and ideas for future meetings. We also have a subcommittee noise and legislative subcommittee. I know Anthony is here and has been a part of those subcommittee meetings and I know that um, start their uh, planning a legislative trip, I believe, to Washington. And I think Deputy Mayor Buxton, you're involved with that, if I'm not mistaken. And, and myself. And, and the mayor, Good, perfect. So that start Highline Forum, um, once again, is an opportunity for the major cities in our area, in our region, not that they're minor cities, but um, major cities, uh, the Highline College and um, the port to meet on an ongoing basis and kind of share events and strategies and activities. Soundside Alliance, which is our economic development regional uh, group, which Deputy Mayor Buxton, are you going to be in every one of these? Are you the, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're the chair of the policy committee for Soundside Alliance. There's also an operations committee that I participate on. Um, which establishes kind of things for the policy committee. And that's always been understaffed and has been challenged for resources. South King County Housing and Homeless Coalition, guess who, who's our representative there? <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Um, but once again, that's something that's evolving and trying to establish the resources to uh, further affordable housing goals in our region. And we joined that because we wanted to be part of a regional effort, and that's what that is providing. Also, um, I attend King County Man C Manager Association meetings, along um, sometimes other staff will attend those. We have relationships with the Association of Washington Cities. We are, for liability, work with Washington Cities Insurance Authority. Um, part of the Washington City Management Association that I was, you know, proud to be awarded a City Manager of the Year years ago by that organization and uh, there was fire chief were you the fire chief then or the deputy mayor? Deputy, just, mayor. Just deputy mayor right flew all the way into Richland uh, for the award and then flew back so that was a great honor having you there along with some of our staff I'm part of the International Sea Managers Association and these are all important because they stay you know you can stay in tune with what's going on nationally 
Um, I participate in some Zoom meetings that are sponsored by the Council on Foreign Relations to talk about specific issues. Um, had the pleasure of getting in an argument with the former vice chair of the Federal Reserve about aggregate demand at one point, um, you know, which was fun. And then uh, we also work with Regional Tourism Authority, which, you know, with under the new leadership has been much more responsive to the city and our needs. And, and uh, Tim has worked closely with that, as has Ashley. Appreciate it. Uh, there are various professional organizations, planning organizations also that um, we participate in. We have multiple partnerships with Wesley and um, worked very closely with them, as did uh, Councilmember Pennington when he was fire chief um, on COVID and prevention and activities that could safeguard their well-being. Okay. Next. So... Um, Citywide activities involved with, we're right now doing the um, comprehensive plan. I think Laura will talk more to some of these, but um, these are all things that, you know, we uh, try to figure out the best way to do, and that's a collective effort. So we work on our updating our comp, our comp plan, our housing action plan, um, effective public safety, one of the, the you know, things that our police department has accomplished, and I think the chief's leadership has been phenomenal and it's gonna be missed, is uh, accreditation. Um, we also do the annual budget preparation, and that's a process where we um, have interviews or discussions with each of the department heads as to what their needs are and what their plans for the future are. And somehow, the request for resources always exceeds what's available, so, um, I shouldn't say this, but my theory of budgeting is you bring everybody in and the people who complain the least, you cut the most, okay? So, no, just kidding. Um, but at any rate, yeah, so we do the budget and we, the budget message and we um, have, as I said, we have been very successful at keeping this city solvent and stable. We uh, prepare the annual conference annual financial statements. That's gonna be in just presentation, but we received ongoing yearly awards for the quality of, the, of those um, financial statements. We um, had meetings with the auditor and all of those have been squeaky clean except for occasionally some specific exceptional issue, some remaining from past uh, regimes and so forth. But we've had clean bill of health from the auditor in every regard. Um, we prepare grant requests, contract compliance for grants received. All of this is interdepartmental, where one department that's, you know, Public Works is great, and Andrew at, at acquiring grants, same thing with the police department. And so we try to work with um, people that have skills. Rochelle has great skills in grant preparation. So she wor may work, you know, multi jurisdictional or inter jurisdictional to try and um, secure money for the city. We uh, provide support for city council, the packets that you get every um, meeting, issues that are outlined. We also support the, the committees and comprehensive work plans that each of those committees prepares and they want information on. And like tonight, there was public safety. There was an update on the uh, cameras. And some, you know, so this is, this is something that key staff devote time to preparing these. So council has the most current information, and that's a, what I consider a huge and significant responsibility that we need to fulfill for the council. As I said, we do the agenda items, we do packets, uh, administrative support for council activities. Last night, I think that the bulkhead event would require notification because there are going to be at least four <laughs> council members present, so the Open Public Meetings Act, which is the state law governing uh, council activities and public activities needed to be fulfilled, and so we had to um, notice that that meeting was taking place. And as the mayor said, Citizens Advisory Committee is something that we want to resuscitate and bring back um, to value. So, uh, also, and Shannon will get, talk more about this later, but in addition to everything we were trying to do to maintain the city, we had to uh, do emergency operations uh, for COVID. And typically, and as I've said before, you know, when you have emergency management, you're thinking there's an external event. 
There's something that happens, something defined, be it an earthquake, be it a toxic spill, whatever it is, it's, it can be def ultimately defined, it can be surrounded, and it can be dealt with over time to try and reduce the impacts. COVID was exactly the opposite of that. It was an internal incident that kept spreading, and it spread through people. And it was very, very difficult in the beginning to get a control on that. And eventually, the pharmaceutical industry created vaccines. We tried to support the use of vaccination in, in our city staff and um, were able to do that, as I mentioned earlier. But we had to coordinate with external agencies, other first responders. Our police department worked closely with the fire department. There were certain protocols in place. There were new protocols, which basically fire, because they had all the equipment, the personal stuff to protect themselves, were literally first on scene unless it was life safety. And then police had to, had to get involved. And there was also emergency medical um, preparation. One thing, for example, is we used a portion of the federal money to contract with outdoor research to provide um, both gowns and masks, I believe, for, for the fire district. So ways that we could both interface with the business piece and the first responder piece. Okay, let's see. Next. Right, city legislative agenda. This only has one bullet, and I like, the, I like slides like this because that's a result of Anthony being so skilled at what he does. Um, but helping us with our legislative agenda, that's something that council approves, and then we go forward working with our legislators, primarily at the state level. We also get involved if it's federal legislation. We've had help from Adam Smith on a number of occasions, not the least of which was his engagement with the permitting relative to the bulkhead permits being issued, and um, at any rate, that's, but it's one more thing that we stay in touch with. I'll talk with Anthony on a regular basis several times a week on legislation, especially as things appear before a committee or are passed on to the, the, the floor of either the House or the Senate in Olympia. Okay. Also, um, so we're, we are not a contract city. You know, we have our own police department, we have our own court, we do our own um, development process, but we do hire consultants for specific reasons. So as mentioned, Anthony is our legislative advocate. Peter Phillips is helping with the water taxi service. He's done just a fantastic job. It's very, very knowledgeable. Skylab Architecture has done design work relative to marina redevelopment. They're like top notch from Portland. And um, also, uh, right, so we will be also, as we bring back design feasibility and financial feasibility for marina redevelopment, we'll also be talking about how do we do that and what will be the, the structure and help we receive to do both the construction and the project management side of this. And that will be um, one other aspect that we have to manage. And then the Holmes Group helps us with redevelopment. And that's Robert, who done, as everyone knows, I'm sure had, had been the primary driver behind the harbor steps in Seattle. And so we have the, the advantage of his knowledge for the marina steps. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. Mayor, if you wanna, if there are questions. Does anybody on council have a question or comment? Uh, Councilman Bernetti. I, thank you, Mayor. I just got a quick question on the score portion of things with uh, King County closing down um, one of our largest jails, uh, are we going to reap any benefits from them joining in um, and possibly buying beds at SCORE? Yeah, that's, thank you so much. Yes, the answer is yes. And there's both DSHS and King County, um, the, the state jail system and the county. Um, both of those were right in the process um, Devon is in the process of negotiating contracts with them, and that will help relieve our our costs associated with SCORE. So, thanks, yeah. Thank you. Anybody else before we have a comment? Okay. Do a sharing there. So one of the things that, that I wanted to know when you talked about the, the budget preparation and the, and the grants and the grants that, that, that we, different um, 
different divisions within the city receive is, um, you know, historically, uh, the budget preparation was was done in a silo, and and it was this is it's had a we've had a long history of of pitting one uh, division against the other within the city, and and grants that were were gotten um, by different parts were also conflicting with other other divisions within the city, and they would overlap and it would be conflicting, and there would be a tremendous amount of of um, actually, well, fighting over uh, matching funds for those grants. Um, and so one of the things that when um, the city manager, when, when we chose Michael as a city manager, one of the things that changed is the siloing of budgeting went away. So everybody kind of, everybody knew what everybody else's needs were. And they sat down and, and, and figured out what what the, the the greater needs were, and one division would say, or one department would say, oh, well, we'll we'll hold on off on that this year. We'll do it next year. That way, you can you can have take advantage of, of the dollars. Um, the the grants that that we've received no longer were conflicting. We had grants that were on top of grants that were you'd leverage one grant to support another, and you were doing all sorts of crazy stuff, and and it was. A huge shell game within the city. That's that's all it was. It's was a big shell game, and 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 the, the the chickens came to roost. And and I tell you, again, and you've heard me say this a lot of times: seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars away from bankruptcy, away from the city being divided up amongst the surrounding cities. So the change in budgeting, the the change in the, the budgeting process, the the um, and, and it 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 created some tough feelings with some folks. They aren't here anymore, but you know what? We are a better city. We are a solvent city. You know we're, we're solid, and and that is that's important because you know everybody wants everything. They want this and they want that and they want something else. Whether you're you know, uh, work for the city or you're a citizen, we're all always asking for stuff, but you know, that money's gotta come from somewhere and you only get so much. And that pie can only get sliced up, you know, so thin. And, and so that's, that's really when, when we, when, as, as I look at a lot of the things that, we, that we're gonna talk about here this meeting and, and, and the next one, you know, the, 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 the the equitable division of that pie is important and how that's, that's accomplished is really important so that everybody's doing things safely and efficiently so that our citizens reap the benefits from that. So thank you to the city manager, to the, the finance staff and, and folks that, that and, and, and some of you were here and some of you weren't, but there were furloughs issued. And that's the investment of the city staff the city employees in, into their city. They, you all have skin in this, in this game, and, and, and you know, you, you hear us talk about that, but again, Council Member Nutting and myself are the, the two that, that walked the walk and spent the late nights and with the city manager and then the mayor at that time figuring this stuff out and working with all our other partners, figuring it out. So we could be sitting here tonight to begin these discussions. Thank you. Let me, I just want to make one comment. <clears throat> you know, Harvard guys have a hard time formulating questions. Um. <laughs> I, you want me to, yeah, no, I want to. I'm that. sorry. <laughs> okay, 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 seriously. So th the point that um, Councilmember Pennington makes is really critical, and that is that the other thing that's not on here is we have collective bargaining agreements, and we work with the Teamsters, we work with the Police Guild, and one of the messages in those negotiations is always interest-based bargaining, we're all on the same side of the table. And there's a, there can be a difference in view as to what's appropriate compensation and what's appropriate dynamics within a collective bargaining agreement. But in every single instance, um, I think we've been successful at convincing the bargaining units that we're on their side. And we are not trying to intentionally balance off interests. We're trying to maximize what we can provide. And there are limits to that. 
But that's the message in everything we do, that, that how can we stretch those dollars? And what um, Councilmember Pennington also is referring to historically is that the city was not disciplined about having structural revenue pay for structural expenditures. There was one-time money paying for structural expenditures, and when the one-time money ran out, we were in the position of it could have gone to receivership in a court. The city could have been in receivership. We were that close. And fortunately, through a lot of discipline and a lot of sacrifice and a lot of involvement by everybody, we pulled out of it, and now we're strong. And that's an incredible accomplishment for everybody who had a part in that. So um, thank you. Deputy Mayor Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to make a comment with all this buying for grants and the, or you know when when that de siloed and and the comment there there wasn't a loss over that. I mean, in the last five years, I added up the spreadsheet during the budget season, and uh, we gained I think a little over thirty million, like thirty one million dollars in grants in the last five years, and so there was no loss with that. Uh, Get, getting rid of that anxiousness over trying to share. Thank you. And the only thing I'll add about the 30 million plus in grants was they were the right type of grants. They were fully funding in most cases and so forth. There wasn't the matching and so forth that we battled before and <clears throat> a lot of times weren't accounted for. With that, I think you can go to the next section. Thanks. And one last comment about that. An example of what you're saying is Midway Park, where it's the first time we'd received grants that did not require matches, partly based on the value that that park development was going to have for that neighborhood. So with that, let's move on to Bonnie. Thank you, Michael. I'm Bonnie Wilkins, Chief Administrative Officer. And as Michael said before, there are four team members in our department. We have a myself, a city clerk who's also, uh, she serves as the civil service secretary and the chief examiner, a public records analyst and a city hall office specialist. And some of our challenges, um, supporting staff and facilitating various ways to re work remotely from home, which includes Zoom meetings, electronic agenda packets, electronic contract approvals, um, just to name a few. Um, we use a lot of technology. We found that during COVID, technology became our friend, and we utilize every tool we can to help us be more productive to respond to our customers, which are both internal and external. And you know me, I always love to give public record statistics. Uh, last year, we received uh, 1,900 requests this, uh, for 2021. Last year, 2,550. And that is by far the most that we have received since my time here at the city. So we have one dedicated person doing all of that, um, Sara Lee, who's phenomenal. Um, Tara and Laura Hopp, our city office hall specialists and um, city clerk, do step in and help out with a lot of the um, reoccurring, we got a lot of reoccurring requests and some of the smaller ones and leave those bigger, larger, more um, complex records to Sarah, but they are doing some training on that. We prepare our agenda packets through iCompass. Um, we also use that for our public records requests. We started utilizing that through um, COVID, and that's worked out real well. And we um, hold our civil service boards, and we started that through COVID as well, and we kind of continue that because we find that we can touch more people and get more people who are actually, um, you know, interested in becoming an officer, and so we get a lot more activity that way. For the future, we continue with our succession planning and our training. Um, both Tara and I are certified municipal clerks, and Sarah and Laura are completing, have completed their first year of the three-year program, and they'll attend their second year this June at the University of Puget Sound. And Tara has received her, like I said, received her CMC. She's working on her master municipal clerk certification, and she'll also be attending her fourth session this June at the University of Puget Sound. And to become a certified clerk, you have to um, put in about 120 in-class hours and many, many various trainings outside of that. It takes about three years to complete, so it's quite, a, quite an accomplishment, and I'm really proud of them. And then Washington Public Records Act, or WAPRO as we like to call it, um, Sarah Lee and Tara are just steps away from becoming certified WAPRO uh, Public Records Officer, and Laura is in the middle of her training, so we're really getting close there. And we just continue to cross-train in all of our positions at the city clerk's office, so if anybody's out or wants to take a vacation, like myself, <laughs> they can do so, and uh, we have a lot of backup uh, for the internal and external customers that we serve. Thank you. Any questions? 
questions or comments from council? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next. Okay, we'll move on to Public Works, Andrew. All right, thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is Andrew Murgis, Public Works Director for the City. Uh, you've seen a couple of these slides previously in last year's budget meeting that we had, but I'd like to review Public Works a little bit about what we do. So the primary functions in Public Works uh, deals with operations and maintenance of city physical assets, roadways, the storm utility, parks, facilities, fleet, and equipment. Uh, we also implement or help implement with other directors the $150 million capital improvement program, the six-year program that we talk about and adopt every year. And those are improvements to existing assets and constructing new assets, like the Bulkhead Project is part of that capital improvement program. Uh, as part of the process this year, it's expected that that staff will engage in how do we start bringing the marina redevelopment priorities into that capital budget and then talk about how do we, how do we uh, assign resources and execute that. So that's gonna be a lot of discussions across, across all city departments on that. We also uh, help out with development review services with uh, Denise and Laura. We review and approve uh, privately built public infrastructure. It's one of our tasks. And we also work closely with emergency management and response. Now with public works operations, one thing I wanted to point out, which I didn't last time is how much we get involved with from a budget perspective. We dabble in the general fund, the street fund, the arterial paving fund, the development fund, service water fund, equipment rental fund, and the equipment replacement fund. So with the staff that we do have, we do a lot of uh, tracking. We try to keep all of those separate budgets in line with council priorities. Uh, and it is a challenge, but it's fun. So we, we get a dabble in a lot. Uh, almost all public works operations are non-discretionary. So the next slide I'll talk about here is a lot of things that we do that we have to do to help the city uh, manage liabilities. A lot of things that we can't say no to. Next slide, please. So this slide, I, I hate putting up a lot of bullet points, so I apologize for that, and I was gonna try to do it in one breath, but we do a lot. So all in the details, in the public works operations, just to run through it for you guys, uh, we do building maintenance, janitorial management, parks maintenance, downtown beautification, like all the planters you see, uh, all the landscaping within public right away and parks. We uh, manage the fuel services uh, in conjunction with, with Scott Wilkins in the, in the marina. Uh, we deal with all sidewalks, guardrails. We manage over 100 miles of roadways, uh, multiple bridges, signs, signal management, traffic and pedestrian services, street light management, traffic control devices, like all the signs you see uh, and all the markings on the streets. Uh, we manage snow and ice control, which I would say is not the most pleasant part of the year. Uh, I'd rather that just be warm all year round. Uh, median maintenance, litter cleanup, right away permits, surface water management, over 200 miles of storm drains, ponds, outfalls, water quality vaults, and flow control facilities. Street sweeping, mosquito, mosquito control, habitat restoration in over 200 vehicles and pieces of equipment. That's just operations. That's a lot of work that we have to manage day to day. We dabble in all of that every day. Now on the public works CIP side, right now in 2023, we have over 45 funded CIP projects for this year alone. And I can guarantee you that with staffing right now, we'll get a handful of those done some will be delayed and we'll be talking about that during the budgeting process and, and just how we, how we manage that type of work. But over the years and the nine years I've been here, it's gone from probably a dozen projects up to what we see now and, and there's a huge demand on resources that just doesn't exist to manage that much from a capital perspective. Uh, we also help with the implementation of the marina redevelopment, like I said, with the priorities. So new capital projects are expected to be added to the CIP budget that we'll talk about. And that, like Michael, uh, like the city manager said, we're gonna have to talk through priorities on, on what we wanna focus on and what can we slide uh, into future years. Next slide, please. So resources, we, we chat about this in the past in the fall a little bit, but I'd like to like, bring, bring a little bit of light to where we're at today. Uh, so the good, in engineering services, uh, we've got one vacancy instead of multiple. We've got 12 FTEs budgeted, which is great. I'd love to have 12 more, but uh, budgeting wise, it's unrealistic. So we're, we're filling positions, operations and maintenance. We've got one current vacancy. Uh, currently, we've got 23 budgeted positions, so that's nice. Still. With the previous slide, as you can see how much operations and maintenance we do, 
we still do a lot for the size of city we are. We have a very small crew for the 35,000 residents that we serve in the city here. So when we talk about the challenges, there's still a very low application rate to any open positions we have. Uh, retirements continue to accelerate, uh, but what we've noticed in the operations as well as the engineering side is that we have a very young workforce. A lot of middle level uh, professionals, a lot of senior level managers are retiring or they're moving on and they're hard to find. So what we've had to do in public works is we've had to, what I call hire down to fill mid-level vacancies. And where that hits us the most is when you have licensed or certified professionals that you need to get work done, like manage a capital project, we can't find those individuals. So it puts a really big gap, especially on our capital project delivery. We've hired down just because like, for example, we've had a licensed engineer position that stays online for say nine months. And at some point when you don't get applications, you have to say, how can I fill that role to start training someone to get to that position in order to fulfill future city needs? And that's what we've done. But what that does is it increases the need for mentorship of younger staff, which is great. I love watching staff grow, but it requires a lot of time. And what I mean by that is from an entry level perspective, from engineering, like to manage capital projects, it takes four years for an engineer to get licensed. So there's a lot of training that occurs in that four years in order for someone to feel comfortable executing a contract and managing a budget consultants and construction contracts. And right now the department has a lot of young staff. We, we've, we've kind of uh, three professional engineers left the city and we haven't been able to fill those. Now we have a lot of young entry level engineers and that's a challenge for us, a great challenge to see people grow again, but it takes time. So I just wanna, wanna talk about, when we talk about the CIP coming up in those 45 plus projects, we can't do it all. And it's gonna take time for us to learn and get, get licensed to be able to continue deliver, delivery at the high rate we've been doing in the past couple of years. Uh, so that, that's a continuing challenge. Uh, I like to see vacancies filled, but, but we're filling at a lot lower level than, than we would like to see currently. And that's all I have for public works. And uh, just one comment, um, which the police chief and I believe AJ will talk about as well. But what we instituted for the police department was um, kind of incentives for laterals and so forth to, to come over and that's been successful and we're starting to look at what the possibilities are to do that with public works so that may be something that that helps but they'll go into it more and yeah that's a great great comment uh city manager matthias i i do coordinate with a lot of agencies a lot of other other folks in my field and most other agencies are experiencing the same problem on where have all the licensed engineers gone where have all the mid-level managers gone and a lot of agencies are throwing a lot of hiring incentives out there. So I'm, we're starting to see the need to maybe start considering that. Uh, what I see happening though, is that even those other agencies that have those incentives, no one's still applying to them. So I'm hoping someday we can figure out where everybody's going, but it, uh, across the region, it's a regional problem, not just a local problem uh, that we're dealing with right now. Andrew, uh, you know, uh, I think with having the youth in, it's it's a good problem, but it's a problem. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about uh, how you're assessing your your younger staff and uh, then basically the plan that you have with them? Yeah, you bet. So, and so, forth? so working closely with HR, when we when I talk about hiring down or filling a, a mid-level position with a entry-level staff, we are very selective on who we bring in to make sure we have a right culture fit. You know, qualifications are great, but I, we look for people who fit well with the city, who can take on a lot of different challenges that pop up day to day. Like I mentioned what you've seen, engineering, even the operations folks, they do a lot. We, we cross over a lot with each other. So the individuals we bring on are excited to do that type of work, excited to learn about everything public works in the city has to offer. And our goals is, is myself, the other leaders like Tommy Owen, the other licensed engineers, we're committed to those individuals as sponsors as they apply and test for their professional licenses. So the senior level staff, we sit there and we actually help mentor them. And then when they actually 
go through the process. We are the sponsors for them as they apply for the state license. So we're committed as the senior staff to make that happen. But it's, it, like I said, it takes time though. Great. Looking down. All right, let's go to the next one. So if Kyle talk about parks. All right, good evening everyone. My name is Kyle Ellers, Recreation Manager for the City of Des Moines. Here to go over a couple pieces of information that will uh, shed light on our department's organizational structure, one of our unique features we have, and finally some challenges we see as a department. So uh, as we take a look at the first slide here, it displays visual of our current organizational structure of both our Parks and Recreation Department and our Senior Services. At the top there, um, you'll see our director, Nicole Nordholm. On that left-hand side, she oversees myself, Recreation Manager, Assistant Recreation Manager, Recreation Coordinator, Program Support Specialist, and our part-time office assistant who works evenings to allow programs to happen. On the right-hand side, uh, Nicole over oversees the Senior Services, uh, manager, senior program assistant, department aide, and our newly hired shuttle driver who takes all our seniors on the trips that they do and uh, all the field trips. So um, that is seven full-time employees between the two departments and three part-time employees uh, who help assist in day-to-day -day activities. Next slide, please. So here we have a little bit of a breakdown of what makes our department pretty unique. Um, we have a heavy reliance on part-time and seasonal hires. They play an intricate part in helping support and facilitate the programs we offer on a day-to-day -day basis and throughout the seasons. Outline on this slide is a breakdown of just some examples that we do, and you'll see at the start, Camp Chaos, which is our summer program that we have over at the field house. That requires about 20 to 30 employees annually, and they help facilitate the day-to-day -day operations of our either 10 to 12 week summer day camp. We'll go down to Club Chaos, which is our after-school program, which requires four to eight employees annually, and they help facilitate the day-to-day -day activities uh, at the basement of the field house, doing crafts, games, and so forth. Youth uh, sports, basketball, soccer, t-ball, coach pitch, we do about 10 to 15 employees, depending on the season. Basketball is a little bit more uh, of a demand. We have a lot of people interested in that sp sport itself. And they help uh, facilitate all the youth sports programs, including referees, scorekeepers, and umpires. Field supervisors requires about four to eight employees, uh, mainly stationed at Stephen J. Underwood with doing uh, Saturday, Sunday field preps, and then co-ed and adult softball throughout the week. And then special events, about four to eight employees, which help facilitate special events, such as breakfast with Santa, extravaganza, and movies in the park. Not on there are uh, contract instructors who also play a heavy part in what we do, um, whether that's uh, dance class, martial arts, um, anything that we decide to bring in as a department. Those also play an intricate part. And our volunteers, which we rely heavily on, um, at any given point during any sports season, could be up to 40 to 80 volunteers, and those are usually parents, siblings, cousins. Um, without them, we would be uh, not able to move on. Um, they also play an intricate part up at the Senior Center, uh, doing the lunch program, um, helping facilitate, clean, and do all those other things. Next slide, please. All right, so finally, some challenges. Um, challenges are inherent, all the departments represented here tonight. Uh, we understand and welcome these challenges as opportunities to grow and adapt when needed. Um, some things just specific that we've been dealing with, as Andrew mentioned, a lot of labor shortages for us. Um, our part-time seasonal hiring, which we've been working hand-in-hand uh, -hand almost on a daily basis with human resources. Um, our non-traditional work hours, so that's Saturdays, that's Sundays, that's evening work, um, seems to be possibly affecting some interest on total numbers of hours available. Um, and then our recruitment, our competitive wages, 
where are we at the market and how are we competing with neighboring agencies. Um, again, that recruitment piece working with human resources to figure out where the eyes are, um, how can we be more visible in order to get people in and, and start having them apply. And our staffing capacity, <coughs> um, although we have labor shortages, we do have a wonderful full-time staff who's very supported throughout the city uh, by everyone. And with that, we're continuing to offer high quality and sound programs, but sometimes those programs become long and hours long are worked, long hours are worked, um, and we want to continue to offer those high quality programs. So, um, and then additionally, um, just continual improvements to our parks, uh, upgraded equipment, new features, um, new programs in those parks with the mindset that um, each park is requiring more attention. That takes employees away from other tasks at hand that need to be prioritized. And so that's what we're uh, beginning to struggle with a bit. So in conclusion, um, we are uh, welcoming challenges and we might encounter more challenges but our small and mighty Parks and Recreation Services Department will continue working hard to provide the highest quality programs that we can to the city of Des Moines. Thanks, thanks Kyle. Um, before you get questions, just a couple of comments. One, it's really extraordinary in parks, as is throughout the city, the amount that they are able to do with the people that are there. It's just extraordinary. The other thing is that relative to improvements to our parks, one thing that we continue to work on and are getting closer to finding some solutions are ways to, especially for the coming summer, hopefully to have um, Stephen J. Underwood open to the public during days, not just special events, and, and to open that up. And the issues, of course, have to do with the hygiene of the bathrooms up there and maintaining those, and then also security for people. So we're working with both um, providers of security, our police department, our parks department, our public works department, in terms of you know how can we facilitate access to those to those assets on a on a on a greater basis for our community. Thanks, Kyle. Two, one, one question and uh, one offer: um, Are we competitive with the market? Yeah, yeah. And like I said, I think um, AJ, myself, Shauna, and Betsy, uh, all when we go out for something, we make sure we're checking neighborhoods or neighborhood cities. Um, I think we are. I think it comes down to that other piece as well as just recruiting and where the eyes are seeing uh, the postings. And the other is more of an offer. If there's ever an opportunity for uh, a council to come and thank your volunteers or your part-time staff, please let us know because Absolutely. you know how they work, how hard they work for our youth and our seniors in the community. So please take us up on that offer when you can. Awesome, thank you. Anybody else? No, okay. Yeah, so we'll move on to community development. Laura and Dan. Who we put all the way Good evening, I'm Laura Tachico, I'm the Planning and Development Services Manager, and I'm here with Dan Hopp, the building official to represent community development. So our department, led by the director, Denise Lathrop, um, is split into the building division and the Planning and Development Services division. About a week ago, we managed to get all but one of our staff together for a photo, but we leave no staff member behind, and so we do what it takes to make sure everyone is represented. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, and so for this one, this is actually the um, Planning and Development Services Division, um, which is a subset of community development. So for this division, we have four full-time employees. Um, one's currently vacant. So there's the Planning and Development Services Manager, a Senior Planner, and a Land Use Planner one. And the position we have currently posted, Andrew talked about hiring down Ideally, we'd like to have a senior planner. We learned when we listed for a planner two and ended up hiring a very strong planner one that we're gonna we went flexible and hired or listed for both the senior planner and the planner two. Um, in terms of our division's primary functions, 
It's assisting in developing the long-range visage for the city and enhancing quality of life through things like jobs, housing, and economic development. Um, so our division is split into two functions. One is development services, and that's the current planning function and arm. Um, through those, we review a, a wide variety of public and private permits. Um, I did not do an entire bullet point list, but just examples are critical areas, shorelines, um, design review, telecommunications, business licenses, and uh, many, many more. And then the planning or plan development arm is our long range planning function. So through this, we develop strategic plans such as the comprehensive plan, the housing action plan. We support economic, economic development efforts, um, track demographics and housing data, and assist in drafting legislation. And many or most of these items are um, regulated or uh, required by the state. And so um, once we've implemented those, they typically trickle down into code changes, and then that rolls back into our current planning functions. Um, part and parcel with being a smaller city is we wear many hats, and so there are a lot of extra functions that we do. A few of them include um, assisting with solid waste and recycling program, code enforcement, and emergency management. So next slide. And then our current, uh, most current long range planning project is the housing action plan. And that is a strategic plan to um, come up with strategies and actions to provide greater housing diversity in the city, more affordability, and access to residents or housing for residents of all incomes. And um, this plan will eventually feed into our comprehensive plan update and that process is just taking off. Part of this um, project, there's a, a mandated public engagement plan and we've worked with our consultant to put together a robust outreach plan. There's been two open houses at Highline College, a tabling event to the Des Moines Library, City Currents, there's a project website, social media. Um, there was an online survey from November through January that yielded over 200 responses. Um, there are one-on-one -on -one interviews with um, a pretty lengthy uh, list of stakeholders from all different um, disciplines. And then our next scheduled event is going to be next week at the Des Moines Food Bank. And then I think the next slide is the building division. We're sort of tag team in this one. <clears throat> uh, hi, my name is... Daniel Hopp, and I am the building official here at the City of Des Moines. Um, and our staff resources are five FTEs, um, the, including myself, the, the assistant building official, inspectors, and plans examiners. Uh, we also have a part-time extra hire, uh, senior plans examiner and consultant um, who's um, uh, graciously retired and came back to help us a little bit as we transition here. Um, we also have two FTEs budgeted that are um, shared permit te technicians with the planning um, development services division. Uh, our primary functions um, were include development review um, and plan, plan review approval and uh, issuing of private and public development permits. So this involves um, the intake of the permits, the review for code compliance, uh, ongoing inspections, um, and then, of course, a, a constant communication with staff, other departments, such as engineering, um, planning, fire, public, the public and contractors. Um, we do a lot of collaboration uh, with, with different departments. And um, a range of permits that we have are like land use, design review, um, building, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire. Um, we've had uh, roughly 1,400 permits come through in the last two years, 2021, 2022, um, each year 1,400. And then uh, so far about two, just under 250 um, this year. So um, our, our permitting staff does an excellent job uh, 
get getting those processed, reviewed, and inspected. Um, Dan, let me let yeah. me just make one comment. Um, I think it's important for everyone to understand that of, of those 1,400 permit applications, every sponsor of each of those permit applications feels theirs is the most important that should get addressed <laughs> right now. Is that true? Well, that, that was just the building department, 1,400. We actually have more like 2,500 total. Um, but yes, you're right. There's, we all are important here. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, to, to move on, let's see. So in inspection services following the issuance of a, issuance of a building permit, it, it, takes a, it takes a lot to get to that issuance, right? We've talked about reviews and, and intake and all that, but then we, uh, once the building permit is issued or any type of permit is issued, um, there's the start of construction. And then, um, then of course, that means the start of the inspection process. And, and then uh, each, each uh, permit is going to have a varying difficulty and com complexity of, of uh, inspections just um, in step with the, the job itself. Obviously, something like Wesley is going to have a lot more complex and much more inspections than a, than a home uh, uh, hot water tank replacement, but but we we inspect everything for for code compliance, and it's really about safety. Um, so, uh, fire and life safety. Speaking of that, fire and life safety um, is I could put this as as the first um, primary function. It is really our main goal, our top goal, and it's it's kind of summarizes uh, what I'll discuss in the later in later de uh, slide in greater detail. Um, uh, code enforcement, it's, it's one of our greatest challenges, um, but it'll also be discussed in a later slide. Emergency management and response. Um, so in the event of emergency, like an earthquake, a landslide, something like that, uh, the de building division, it, each division is going to each department is going to have their own responsibilities, but the building division will do um, what's called a windshield inspection to ensure the stability uh, of our critical infrastructure that, and make sure they're operational. Um, that would include like fire departments, sewer, water districts, and anything that affects the public health of the community. And then we'd focus our attention to the rest of the community. Um, and that's for that slide. Um, and then this one is, uh, yeah, in the uh, department as a whole, um, our goals and um, what we work towards, like Dan said, primarily to protect the lives and safety of the residents and the visitors to the city, preserve quality and enhance quality of life and contribute to the economic development of the city. Um, you know, the, the goal and the challenge is obtaining training and retaining qualified individuals and then, you know, further in terms of the current um, permit process, streamlining that. Um, right before COVID hit, we started implementing electronic permit intake and review. And, um, you know, it was just in the initial stages and we expedited in implementation and we were able to continue processing permits throughout COVID with people working remotely and people being able to submit electronically. So we're still working to improve those, but um, it's an ongoing process, but it's um, something we were able to implement very quickly and um, went pretty fairly smoothly, so. Uh, I have a quick question. So <clears throat> right now in uh, the house, there's legislation on middle housing about duplexes, triplexes, quads, and small apartment buildings. If that passes, will that be an additional impact to what you're already trying to do this year and the years to come? That will change most of what we're doing right now. I mean, we've been planning towards our comprehensive plan and what the city looks like. We've been planning towards what, you know, where we're focusing infrastructure and developing our city. So um, that will have a huge, and probably shoot to the top of <laughs> some of those work programs. So essentially, you're going to have to almost shift everything you're doing then. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So 
the uh, one of the bullets I'll skip down and I'll come back because you just mentioned it is the code maintenance and changes uh, directed by state legislation and council. So that that is a challenge when we, when we have a um, uh, a lot of what we do is mandated by the state uh, to enforce minimum code and RCWs come out and then the WAC is is sort of um, uh, interpreting that and into code and and so when those changes come out, it, it creates a challenge for us to, to maintain um, how to regulate and enforce those, those laws. Um, every, every year, I mean every three years uh, for the building code, uh, it changes. And so that we are, there's always ongoing um, uh, education. There's always um, a new code coming around the corner and you gotta, uh, the state, mandates it and then we have to enforce it but also educate the public as best we can. Um, and at first it starts with us, we have to educate ourselves and then, um, then we educate the public, the contractors, the homeowners um, and, and a lot of that's through uh, just our conversations with them through permitting process, through um, the website, we have lots of resources on the website. Uh, so a lot of um, that does present a challenge, um, but our, just to kind of reiterate what Laura was saying about our, our objective to, for fire and life safety and what I was saying earlier, um, the, the codes, the proper code compliance ensures that the life safety, structural integrity and accessibility of new construction alterations and repairs as well as safe installation of electrical, solar, plumbing, fuel gas, heating and air conditioning. So that's the intent of these codes, and um, we accomplish that through enforcement of federal, state, and local codes um, governing construction. So um, the codes also protect the firefighters and emergency responders uh, during building emergencies. Um, there's a lot of education that we do. We try to learn something every day. Uh, never stop learning is kind of um, our goal. There's approximately 20 adopted codes uh, that regulate construction and accessibility for new and existing structures. Uh, we always have to, um, that they're always changing and we always have to keep up with that as well. Um, what, one of our challenges is obtaining and training and, and retaining qualified individuals. Um, uh, it's kind of a common theme going around, the labor shortages, that, that was, no different from our department. We, I was fortunate to be part of a succession planning um, process and going through that, um, it really helped me grain in myself that, that that's, um, that's how the, um, uh, how I should be looking at my own staff. And it's always uh, room for improvement and, and growth and opportunity. Um, and as long as that is there and present, there's um, um, a good chance you're gonna retain the individuals you get. I'm very fortunate to have a wonderful staff, uh, like many of us around uh, in this room have just great staff, and the uh, goal is to, re to retain and, and, uh, and to grow. And, but um, staff turnover is, uh, uh, is, is always a possibility and it's, um, for my case, it was uh, due to um, retirements. We had we had lost about 100 years. I think we talked about this before. 100 years of over over 100 years of experience, and um, it's hard to replace that. And I was fortunate enough to have uh, one of them come back in a part-time um, uh, manner to to um, help mentor and and keep us going. Um, Code maintenance, and oh, I just went over that. Ad adapting to post-COVID environment. Um, obviously, I'm not saying COVID is gone, but the, the environment has changed um, since we've um, gone through the mandate, uh, the state mandate that, that, um, that you mentioned before. And, and that was a challenge in itself, but you know, even after we've gone through it, they, um, there's a new, um, new way of doing things, uh, how could we, how can we learn from it 
And one of the things that we did learn is technology is a great thing. It could be um, tough to deal with sometimes, uh, impersonal, but it, it can be used correctly. And we've, we've tried, we've implemented um, uh, some digital review software and um, pretty much everything is digital now. We have uh, um, introduced flex schedules and transition to everything electrical, electronic, and increased security recently by creating a secure check-in process by collaborating with um, the court lobby and, um, and the new city hall's location. Um, so on ongoing, I'll go to the next one, ongoing enforcement code enforcement. This has been a real challenge for us. Um, it's unlike anything we, we do other in other areas. Everything else is, uh, uh, has its due process and if somebody has a plan they want to submit, it's all done in, with an order. Um, with code enforcement, it's out of that process and it just disrupts everything that we do. So it takes a lot of staff time and um, there's some unhappy parties that are being told what to do with their their building or whatever, and so we're trying to work as best we can with them. Um, the, the, right now, we have over 100 open backlog of um, uh, code enforcement cases. Um, our, we all work together in this, but we are one code enforcement officer that we have, Corey Batterman, does, does an outstanding job, and he works really well with us, but he is just one guy, so it's, it's hard to get everything done. That's the challenge that we have. Um, and our primary goal there is obviously, again, safety for the community, uh, making sure everything's done correctly um, and safe. Um, our primary, primary, we're primarily complaint-based, um, it's the way we've been operating. Of course, if we see something, we do something. Um, but if, if if a complaint comes in, we, we respond as best we can. Um, and then our goal is to seek compliance over prosecution. Prosecution is always an option, but of course, we'd, we'd rather, much rather, just get compliance. Um, and talked about the staffing constraints, just um, with which is one, um, currently one code officer, code enforcement officer. Um, and then maintaining fairness while gaining compliance. Um, like I said before, there is an order to the permitting process and uh, code enforcement action is oftentimes in the middle of a project. This can take up a lot of staff time and in order to get them to the right track, on the right track, um, it, it takes a lot of our time. But, however, once they get to an application and in for review, it's hard for them to, for many, to understand um, that there's no line jumping and they just have, there's other people that have gone through the process correctly. So it's more education um, and, and trying to discuss that with them. Um, so that's it for the challenges. Um, and then I can go to the next slide. So here's some highlights of what what's going on out there. We, some of these projects have already been completed. Um, some of these are still ongoing. Uh, I just wanted to show some of what we're doing out there and inspecting. Um, you know, you, you see the uh, former Van Gaskin Park up there. That was just kind of a fun one. Soundview Park, the deck and paths and landscaping art. And we have the Point by Vintage, it's a five, next to that, five-story mixed-use building with 161 units um, with parking below. And then, of course, Popeyes and Burger King and um, 7227 mixed-use is another one that's continuing to, to grow right now. And then, of course, the Des Moines Theater that we're all excited about. Um, the repurposed building, um, theater retail, multi-use, and residential living. Uh, of course, we're excited about all these projects, I should say. 
Uh, North Marina bathroom, uh, just got recently finished at the, at the North Bulkhead. And then the um, Wesley Homes phase three, of course, with many uh, um, memory care units and catered living and care center beds and a total of 185 units. It's our biggest project we have going on right now. And that's, that's it. So Dan and Laura, thank you so much. So a couple of comments about, so when, when Dan is saying that 100 years of experience walked out the door, that was because all these projects were waiting for that to happen. So you, <laughs> so, so, so you, so you got all of them. So it can but, age 100 years. That's right. But I think one of the things that's really interesting is in the slide where you had the uh, bullet points prior to this. You know, just the way that slide is organized shows you the depth of knowledge and the great job you're doing. Because there, you are balancing so many different pieces to this. And one thing, for example, you know, compliance. Okay, with what? Compliance, you have to address international business code, uh, building code. You've got to do the state requirements. You've got to do all the emergency management pieces. You've got to do what the local um, code requires. And all of those have to happen simultaneously. And um, these guys are doing a great job. I think one thing also uh, is important to understand relative to emergency management, which Dan alluded to in terms of windshield surveys and so forth after an event occurs. But there's kind of a distinction here between your response to an event and then ultimately your recovery from an event. And it's the building official who's the bridge between those because you're determining is the structure or situation safe to begin a recovery process. So they're the ones that kind of create that transition from response to recovery. Absolutely critical aspect and you never know when that's gonna happen. Um, they also were very creative in finding ways to implement virtual and digital tools during COVID and continue inspections happening without face-to-face -face contact, but people seeing things on computers and, and laptops and so forth. So overall, I mean, we should really be proud of both community development and our building department for doing such a great job. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do you have a couple of questions? Yeah, I'll start with uh, Councilmember Nutting and then DU Councilmember Harris. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I just got a couple questions, and I think that uh, um, City Manager Matthias answered, answered it. Um, first off, we we um, follow the IBC, Correct. right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, and that's updated in July every year, is uh, it's every three years. So every three it years. It's scheduled to uh, be updated this July. Um, of course, that's subject to change. I mean, they. Of course, this is a challenge all the time. Um, and then the next question is, is um, since we've become a city that's moved into a, a, a great deal more uh, commercial construction, how, how much do we rely on owners to provide special inspections or inspectors um, like Mays or MTC? Or, and, and what are we relying on them to do? Are we like the earthbound systems or... or um, rebar concrete i mean what what yeah. what do we rely on the owners to provide good question um it's actually is mandated in the ibc like uh you mentioned um there's chapter 17 it'll talk about all the different it has a big long list of of what special inspections are required for a job so like one for like wesley um there are many um that we would not necessarily go out and look ourselves a special inspection like May's uh, company would go and um, they would do those inspections and we'd see the reports so if we make sure they're conforming and um, but there there is a is a laundry list and uh, um, I can get you that later probably you know. no it's okay I just okay. I just wanted to know that Oh, yeah. we're relying yeah. on special inspectors we, and we are and um, it is we're following the the guidelines in the IBC for for that okay and then the last we're, we're still we're st we still have an electrical inspector we don't contract with L and I to do electrical inspections correct we're, correct. we're uh, we have our own division that Rex Christensen started um, a while back he was one of my mentors um, uh, Rex, uh, Rex mentored myself and Jamie Wagon uh, to to kind of take over that we both start we have background in electrical 
Um, Jamie is our assistant building official and our chief electrical inspector, so he, he's in that position to do that. Perfect. I, those questions were just to highlight the fact that we've got an exceptional building division that sometimes working with L and I and other inspectors is very difficult. And yeah. Um, so yeah, no, we're doing very well. Great. I think a lot of contractors like to deal with just one jurisdiction, so they it's a really good service for us to provide. I would like to add that we did um, hire another electrical inspector too, so we have three, which is pretty pretty unique for a uh, size jurisdiction we have. Yes. Well, as long as we continue to help get everybody to yes instead of yes how to stymie things, then we're good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Councilmember Harris. just have to turn it on and it um, so anyway um, yeah thank you Daniel uh, I was struck by um, you spoke of the code enforcement deal as being quite onerous and I was wondering if you could kind of expand on the process for when a complaint comes in via the uh, I assume it's primarily by the website nowadays um, yes. and and how that you know gets handed off to Corey or I internally you know Sure. Um, like I said, Corey does handle quite a bit of different complaints, and not all of them are building related, but um, a lot of them are. The complaints can come through uh, our permit track system, is a permitting software that we use online, and it also can come through email or phone. Um, it, it, uh, however, it reaches us, we, we will. If it comes to us directly, we will try to um, deal with it um, uh, by ourselves if we can. If we can't, we call Corey. <laughs> so Corey is is our uh, you know he he's helped us a lot and he'll um, uh, just drop almost drop anything and just um, help us there. So we partner with him quite a bit, um, but to. To that point, I mentioned a number earlier. It, there, there's a lot of code enforcement actions that don't even make it to our system because we are able to deal with it as they come in, and it, it's a lot of paperwork for for um, that that could bog us down uh, for what staffing we have. So, if we can get them to compliance in a day or two, then that's ideal, and it never makes the system seen it. But, uh, but that's. Again, part of our goal is for compliance, right? So, and, and let me add to that. Um, thanks, Dan. Also, code enforcement is not simply the sort of uh, venue for Corey, but code enforcement is multidisciplinary, depending on the dynamic. And what's is it a building issue? Is it a you know somebody isn't cleaning up their yard issue? Is there um, you know, vagrant property, whatever that is, um, that's something that could involve all the way from our city attorney's office to the building department, to Corey as code enforcement, to the police, depending if there's a life safety issue or fire. So it's multi-jurisdictional approach to almost every issue that, that comes up. Some of them are fairly straightforward, and others are extremely complicated. And when we first started this about five years ago, maybe six years ago when code enforcement went to PD to start with, we had, Tim and I had constructed a list of maybe, I don't know, there was about um, 20 properties that were problematic in the city. And, um, it, you know, they, we did 10, and then we did the next 10, and then we moved on. So there's been a very focused, effective um, response with code enforcement. And, and to say, Nothing of the fact that it usually overwhelms our capacity to address it, depending on the situation and the length of time anything is out there. So, yeah, it, thank you, uh, City Manager Michael. I, and just to piggyback on that, we um, we have a lot of uh, code enforcement items that that a lot of us will take. It's not just Corey, like you said, um, we'll take on ourselves. But there are a lot of them that just kind of linger, and it's and legal will get involved, and it'll be it'll be hard to figure out how to get them into compliance because there's a lot of resistance on the inside. So, legal helps a lot. We we 
work as a team, try to try to get it to that point. But um, there are some challenging ones out there. Uh, thank you, Daniel. The, the other thing, and this may just be rhetorical, I'm glad to hear you've got three uh, electrical guys. Uh, uh, are you at the point now where you're seeing um, something, uh, there's going to be a wave coming of EVs and um, it's just going to change the whole grid. Is that some kind of education that you're thinking about now a couple of years you know down the road or has that kind of thing not hit yet um it's it's we're starting to see them especially at homes um they're they're putting them in there uh we're we're seeing a lot of um uh, solar panels putting on the houses and everything and, and heat pumps so so that that sort of s stuff is is happening EVs are definitely part of that. We're not seeing a lot of chargers commercially yet, but I, I know that is in the code to have them um, in new buildings to be either ready or to have them um, put in. So that that is coming too. That's part of what the state has recently required. And one last thing about that. Recently, I'm familiar with a resident who was going to, uh, wanted to upgrade his voltage for EV and you know, building department handled it, permitted it, allowed it to take place, and now they're charging their cars in their garage. Yeah. So. No, I'm just, I'm just thinking about, you know, it's what when the dog catches the bus. What happens when you have 500 people with, you know, their uh, superchargers and so on, and um, you know, what, what does that do when to the grid when people, because it's going to happen fairly rapidly. All of a sudden, it's going to be like with DVD players or CDs. People are all of a sudden just going to shift, and it's going to happen quickly. Um, and the power brokers from the electric companies are going to be the ones that are going to have some response to that as well. Uh, one hopes. Thank you. Is that it? Okay. Um, Councilmember Steinmetz, if we can move the mic his way. <clears throat> okay, just, just actually a couple of comments. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing the initial housing action plan presentation at Highline College, uh, as did um, Deputy Mayor Buxton, uh, and I think mm -hmm. Matt was there, mm -hmm. the mayor was there as well. And it is a fascinating subject to look into. Anybody that's concerned about the future of Des Moines and what kind of housing we're going to need in the future should avail themselves of that presentation just to get a sense of, of where we are headed and the kind of things that we're going to need to do in order to uh, be in compliance. So I would encourage you on the 8th at um, uh, the food bank, uh, if you can attend that, it, everybody should. So uh, that's a really good program and a really good presentation. And then secondly is that uh, as a consumer who's gone through the per uh, permitting process lately, uh, I built the house from tore it completely down, took out the foundation, and started again. We had a very good process. It was not perfect, um, but you know, your, your department was responsive. Your department was, gave good suggestions as to how to come into compliance when there were questions about it, and I just want to compliment you on that. I, I, it, was not, um, uh, it was not an unpleasant experience at all, and, and that was great. So thank you. But that's good, and no one recognized that that Steinmetz applying for the permits would somehow on the council. So. <laughs> well, that, that's why I let my contractors handle it, and I didn't I didn't get anywhere near no, it no, just that, for that, that reason. It didn't played no role. I'm just no. mm -hmm. council member Nutty. Thank you. This is my second, so I'll keep it short. Um, Chief and I, and and some other officers. Um, had the pleasure of meeting with, um, and this is for Laura, um, had the pleasure of meeting with um, several business owners up at the Four Points last night. And um, the biggest response for them up there was that Recology is not working well with um, the business owners. Uh, PD will go through and say, this is what you need to do to keep vagrants and illicit activity not happening on your property. And then Recology will say, we're not gonna pick up your trash if you do those things. So um, 
I, I, I don't know if it's a question or a purpose, but we need to get Recology on the same page as PD. Um, there's a, there's challenges up on the highway. Um, PD is trying to make it better for our businesses and Recology is pushing back. And if, if businesses have to take three or four extra steps to get their trash picked up or their recycling picked up, um, it's just not going to happen. So then it compiles and then, then they adhere to what Recology wants and then illicit activity continues to happen up there. So um, being part of the waste management, um, I, I, I just like some input and, and maybe Chief's got some um, input too as well. Go ahead. And then we'll if I can just add a, <clears throat> a quick clarification. So I've been with Corey twice uh, this week on code enforcement issues. And I just want to clarify, I believe it's not just what PD police department is recommending, but actually according to Corey, what we're recommending is the code. And Corey said for code enforcement, this to be in compliance, the business has to do this. And the businesses are saying when they they comply with code compliance, Recology is not picking up their their uh, waste. So I just wanted to be clear; it wasn't for the just suggestions. Yeah, it, it, according it's to Corey, it's a code issue. Code enforcement. Okay. And definitely something that as they come up um, with addresses. I mean, we have a government liaison with them. We're meeting with them and their uh, their. Um, customer service managers and, and their outreach people. And so, um, you know, maybe if not a one-off, then at one of the monthly meetings, using that as a subject of discussion and, you know, finding, because they're, they're always more than happy to find that solution that works. So um, I think maybe it's just making sure all parties at the table at the same time. Right, and may, I think we're gonna have at least quarterly business meetings up along the highway, but and maybe we can invi invite one of you guys next time, because one of the biggest issues at the meeting was the uh, unhappiness or displeasure with Recology right now, so. Well, let me know, and the, yeah, I know they'll be happy to send, you know, to nominate someone at a high level to come and, and attend those meetings, so. Perfect, thank, thank you. All right, let's, let's move on to the next subject. Okay, I think we're moving on to four. Good evening, I'm Jeff Friend, Finance Director. I'm here to share uh, what we do in finance. Uh, so we'll go through the main fi uh, functions of the finance department, uh, beginning with budgeting. Budgeting, we manage the annual budget process. Uh, the process lasts many months and involves um, every department in the city. So it is quite the undertaking and uh, as Michael's mentioned, is key to uh, keeping the city solvent and in good financial standing. Um, a part of that process is also creating the capital improvement plan, uh, which projects out the uh, capital projects uh, and the, the cost associated and the funding associated with that plan uh, for the next five years. Uh, it didn't get a bullet point, but also part of the budgeting process is uh, approving budget amendments at the end of the year as we assess where we're at um, in, the, in the budget as the year's gonna close so that we're not over budget in any uh, particular fund, which would uh, result in a finding from the state auditor's office. Uh, financial reporting uh, is the uh, second big task uh, or function that we engage in. Uh, the main piece of that process is creating the annual financial statements. Uh, this year we are switching from uh, what we've done historically is uh, what's referred to as gap accrual accounting and presenting a um, annual comprehensive financial report. They changed the order of the, <laughs> in the name there, so it's still hard to say. Um, so we're gonna be reporting our annual statements on a cash basis, which should save the city on uh, our annual audit costs. Uh, and also, it should be a report that's much easier to understand. So it's just 
a better value for the city as um, the standards for creating the prior type of report was just um, getting insane, as my predecessor uh, Beth Ann would say, they've just lost their minds. <laughs> so we we saw that the, we we're making the change uh, because it's just a better value. There's was getting to be really no return on investment for all the staff time and all the effort and all the complexity we had to work on to create a, a larger document. Um, along with financial statements, of course, comes the audit. Um, we, there's actually two audits that the, the city goes through every year. Uh, the first is the annual financial statement audit where the auditors come in and they audit the financial statements uh, for their accuracy and if they're fairly stated, uh, which they are. And uh, secondly, the annual accountability audit. Um, that is an audit that is about um, compliance, compliance uh, with policies. Um, also, uh, they check internal controls, uh, which is an important piece of pretty much uh, whatever, uh, wherever money is involved, you want to have internal controls to safeguard uh, taxpayer funds. Uh, so they give us, since I've been here, and I think even before we've had uh, clean accountability audits. Uh, also, um, along with financial statements, we've received four consecutive uh, government financial officers, associate, officers association awards. Um, another part of financial reporting, of course, is we do more than just annual, uh, but we present uh, quarterly reports uh, to the city council. And uh, we also report uh, monthly to each department uh, from the accounting system so, that, so they can see their budget and actual um, numbers as we go through the year. Another very important thing we do is we pay the employees. So payroll, it's almost its own discipline. Um, I think maybe a lot of people think that there's just a button that gets pushed and it spits out paychecks. Um, I. <laughs> There's a lot that goes in to running a payroll twice a month. Um, you know, people, they get step increases, they might have, you know, benefits change or, you know, contracts uh, such as with the Guild or the Teamsters might become approved. And then there's a lot of changes you have to program into the system. And uh, those changes get audited. Um, they, you know, HR works collaboratively, uh, human resources with uh, our payroll department, um, we have 24 pay periods a year. 100, uh, this last pay uh, roll period, we had 176 employees and two uh, bargaining units. And um, going on, uh, the general ledger. So at the end of the year, before we can do financial reporting for the whole year, uh, we have to close out the year. Uh, that necessitates a lot of uh, journal entries and accounting uh, things that will probably put most of the, everybody asleep, but, <laughs> but we close the books. Uh, and then when the books are closed and we've done the analysis to make sure that everything is correct, uh, then we can begin working on the annual financial statements. And that's really uh, one of the things we're working on uh, at the current time. Um, there's also the treasury function. So as I mentioned before, um, we have internal controls. One of those is that we monitor our cash. Um, we monitor it more than on a monthly uh, basis, but we do on a monthly basis uh, bank account reconciliations. Uh, then again, uh, part of the treasury function is also investments, and so we make investment decisions. So we do have um, investments in certain uh, bonds, and sometimes those mature, they get called, and then we meet with our uh, our broker and we choose new ones um, to invest in um, so that's when we make investments um, issue debt so the other part of a treasury function is issuing debt so when the city decides at one time or another to uh, issue bonds uh, that comes from finance um, there's a lot of preparation uh, for that before uh, you the bonds are actually sold. Um, and then after uh, the city takes on bonds, uh, we have to make sure to make our debt payments and comply with the bond agreements. Okay, and um, the next bullet point, we also respond to financial and special requests from within city government and city council. 
So it could be, you know, um, someone might look at their budget and say, you know, ask finance, why is this number this number? And, you know, I had these plans, but this isn't what I expected. So there's a lot of analysis that goes on or, you know, back and forth with departments in a collaborative way uh, to, to communicate what was anticipated in the budget, which may, you know, sometimes people forget there's a lot of numbers. <laughs> But um, but we work with other departments uh, when they have questions about what's going on with their budget. Okay, um, we the next two bullet points is we collect money and we spend money. So uh, accounts receivable, we process uh, business licenses and business and occupation uh, tax payments. Uh, in fact, and I think I have in a later piece of this presentation, we've uh, hired a last year a staff account who's primary focus is uh, working with the business licenses. And that's a unique position because it's also kind of a customer service posi uh, position because we get calls from businesses if somebody's trying to get their license. Um, they maybe they're having an issue with the portal or they have questions about how much they you know should pay for their license. Um, they can call finance and, and they can get that customer service. Um, and then there might be other issues on the next bullet point uh, to collect funds that are due to the city. Uh, there can be a very variety of reasons, you know, why we'd be collecting money. Um, maybe there's, you know, a project that, like, maybe somebody's house was demolished and they owe the city for those funds that were used to, you know, cost, that cost the city to demolish the house or something like that. Uh, accounts payable, uh, we have two paper check runs per month. And we also have electronic ACH payments made weekly. So uh, we do have a number of vendors that are on electronic payments. And we do, uh, in the department, want to do as much electronically as we can. Uh, project accounting. This is um, one area that has improved tremendously with our new financial management system. Um, we had. <laughs> We didn't have a module in the prior system that actually did project accounting. We had spreadsheets. So this was really done in Excel. And now with the new system, um, we can have an activity. It could be a capital project. It could be actually something else where we want to track the costs for that particular item. And we're able to do that. Um, and along with project accounting, I should have given this one a bullet point, but we also uh, do grant accounting. So there's a lot of capital uh, projects that have grant funding as part of their funding. Uh, and we work with the departments uh, who have grants and somebody managing those grants uh, where we uh, help apply for the reimbursements and close out grants. Um, capital assets, uh, so if the city owns cars, like police cars or buildings, uh, we keep track of those uh, capital assets and we depreciate them over time. Okay, in our department, we have seven positions. We have a finance director. Uh, we have a financial operations manager, is Eric Mandelis, who was just promoted into that position. Uh, we have a payroll and benefits specialist, uh, Michelle Allen, a senior accountant, who's uh, Jackson Swigert, who was just promoted into that position. We have two staff accountants that were both uh, hired last year. They're both phenomenal. Uh, one of them is the one that I mentioned that uh, works with the business licenses, and the senior accounting specialist who was just promoted into that position <laughs> uh, is uh, Kathy Rosick, who has very deep knowledge, and she even trains, you know, other people in the department. And uh, we were able to promote those people, um, those positions, because we did not replace the deputy position. Uh, felt it was more strategic to have somebody working with business licenses uh, than it was to have a, a deputy. Um, and then we we're also able to um, promote people within the department. And we're also very fortunate because Human Resources worked with us and created job descriptions that um, have career tracks. And so uh, one of the challenges is that we have a very small department and it can be flat. So if you have somebody as, as talented as our staff accountant or senior accountant, they have a career track to look forward to. Um, so I'm personally very proud of this group. This is the best finance department I've ever been associated with in my career. So when Michael says we have great people, we, I mean, in the finance department, we have just an outstanding group that I'm just very proud to be a part of. Okay, next slide. 
Uh, challenges that we have in the uh, department is improving the business license process. That's an in ongoing challenge. Um, we've worked with Diane Marcotte, who's a consultant. Uh, we've hired, as I note below there, uh, a staff accountant to uh, work. So we can put more resources towards that process. Um, and our, our database is getting cleaned up. Uh, File Local is the portal that is used for the business licenses. They have new uh, leadership that I'm very impressed with. And so we've been working with them, and I think it's getting a lot better than it was a year or two ago. Um, the second one is uh, the department restructure workload, uh, which is the sub point of managing succession uh, transition dynamic. I've kind of spoke to that a bit. Uh, but our, I mentioned the promotions. Uh, we have, between the financial operations manager and the senior accountant, those two are basically trading a lot of their job duties. So there's a lot of deep cross-training uh, going on. And it was, our payroll person uh, was unable to, uh, due to illness, wasn't able to do a, a, a payroll recently. And we actually had a team, because of cross-training, be able to do the payroll without missing a beat, which was just, Fantastic. Um, another challenge we have is just maximizing available technology. So we do have a new system. So having the technology isn't the issue as much as uh, continuing to learn it. So there's just a lot of capacity and capability with our system that we still, you know, we still have to learn and make sure we're maximizing to, so that we're as efficient as possible. Um, and then another challenge is maintaining the clean audits with the state auditor's office. So we have a lot of things going on, a lot of changes going on, uh, but you know, our hope is to maintain those clean audits. So the approaches we've taken, I've mentioned we've hired staff accountant to manage the business license process. Um, file local, I think they're improving symmetry and user experience with that. So I think our database in the, of accounts and the accounts that they have on record and that the city has on record is, is being matched up a lot easier, which is making it easier to uh, apply for a business license. Uh, Cross-training, I've mentioned that um, already. And uh, training opportunities from the software provider. So that's how uh, we wanna make sure we're maximizing our available technology with our, our new systems. There's a conference in May that um, myself and uh, two others will be attending. And that's it. Now we go to information technology. Uh, <clears throat> so they do a few things, and it's, they do so much it's hard to put it in just a few slides and bullet points, um, but they do hardware support, so they maintain, patch, and replace as needed. The city has 332 computers um, at work, home, and mobile, and 38 servers. Software support. They install, maintain, and provide support for 32 different software applications uh, used by various departments. Um, other support and maintenance. They support the city's phone system. Uh, we should note we are actually in the process of getting a new phone system um, installed. Uh, email system, they support that. Cybersecurity systems, the city website, uh, Channel 21 AV system, police video in, in car and body cams, fuel systems uh, for public works in Marina where we sell fuel, building access systems, uh, so for like the city hall buildings and, and PD, and the security camera systems. Next slide. So their challenges are succession planning to prepare for the IT manager's future retirement. Uh, the department consists of the IT manager, and I believe two systems administrators, I'm not sure if I got the exact job titles right, we didn't list them out, but there's three people that make up our inf uh, IT department. Uh, another challenge is more hardware support with hybrid work environment. Uh, COVID accelerated shift away from in-person processes to ones requiring technology, which has increased their workload. And finally, as older systems are replaced, the new systems are more complex and require more support resources. Uh, for example, the old financial system had one server. The new Munis system requires six. <laughs> That's it. Questions, comments? Uh, after these questions and comments, we're going to take a five-minute break. 
Councilmember Harris. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Just for the pen. So, um, just roughly speaking, how many man hours does it take to, uh, person hours, does it take to generate the quarterly reports that we take a look at? I mean, or is that a silly Council question? Right. I don't, we don't want to go there because we have a new system. We're in place, which okay. we're trying to establish what the regularity of use of that system is. So I don't want to right. um, speculate. Well, my second, then my second question is, um, is, uh, can, can you give me an example of something that is, you know, part of your project accounting that's not a capital project? Or I guess I'm just speculating, is there something, can you see a, a day when everything from code enforcement to, you know, it, uh, basically every every service the city provides is uh, part, you know, is assigned a project code? Council member, if you want to submit some type of written request, the purpose tonight is to describe what is currently occurring and not what future potential events could occur. So we'd be happy to answer that in a different venue. I, I asked for an example if that's, a, Mr. Friend said that there are, you know, some non-capital projects now that are, uh, you know, part of that. And I just wondered if you had an example. If, if you don't, then you don't. I think we don't. Any other questions? All right, seeing none. What time we got, what, eight oh, 856? 756? 
They did talk about this when I was down at Olympia for Wasp Day. Yeah. This year's budget is projected to be the largest in the history budget, uh, more money than they've had to work with. So if this year, if that's too big of a budget hit this year, then that concept is never going to work. If it can't work when there's more money than the state has ever had to work with, yeah. Yeah. it ain't never going to work. It, it, it's, it's a five point surplus, but, but a huge amount of that will be sucked up by uh, the contracts. Uh, I've got to make sure and, and, and then there's these housing initiatives. Yeah. It's a little tiny break again. It's all about priorities. Oh, 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 oh yeah. Yeah, no, uh, right. Uh, um, no. It's either a priority or it's not. Uh, and, but there's, there, there's an initial 500 million going into housing uh, last year this year. Uh, and, uh, uh, but th this would be something along that, that same amount. But, but uh, police, you know, but yeah, to zero to police. And, and, and it's not yeah. taking money away. Well, it's taking money away. What I want them to pass is the no traffic stops for low level. So anyway, sorry, here. Uh, yeah, because they can't get pulled over for it. So why would we? Why would you get it? All right, if we can get everybody back. Amendment out there that might do it. Everything except that. That you, you could pull yeah. over if it's more than six months. Uh, but uh, but now this year. All right, let's go ahead and get started, and uh, we'll turn over to the police chief. Police chief, yes, talk about. Okay. So as you can see, this is our um, organizational chart. Uh, we've got Assistant Chief Richards with patrol, Assistant Chief Cooey with uh, support services. Uh, our patrol division, there are guys and gals that go out there, call response 24-7, uh, and just basic uh, patrol operations. Next up are uh, detectives, and they, they do the uh, cases that get referred back to detectives, and really a big hit has been the Valley Independent Investigative Team, so we're part of this multi-jurisdictional team and that team gets used a lot and then support services uh, our records division you've heard a lot about Corey with code enforcement and our uh, community engagement you may have seen us a lot we were out last night um, with council member nutting at a business meeting up along a uh, business watch meeting up along pack highway we've had a couple of coffee with the cops we're really trying to get out there a lot more i uh, go ahead uh code enforcement we've you've heard a lot about this tonight from a lot of different divisions 
And uh, so I don't want to repeat what's said, but gosh, everybody works together on code enforcement. And we, if we had about three more of them, we could get close to catching up with all the work that needs to be done there. Challenges, uh, new laws on police reform. Uh, we, uh, I was just talking with Anthony about that as he was walking out. Doesn't, uh, I guess it's 50-50 at best if uh, we're gonna get some changes for that pendulum to swing uh, back, um, hopefully. Uh, effectively dealing with the mentally ill and drug addicted. Uh, we've got our co-responder getting people services team. Uh, we're in the process of hiring a second person. I think that's going to be um, great. Under challenges, one other issue uh, very quickly is a lot of uh, our directors, we've, we've all shared the challenge of staffing. Uh, about three months ago, we had four openings, and we have three lists uh, in our department to hire from, new hires, laterals, and then there's one intermediate list. We had zero people on all three of those lists. Uh, I went down, uh, worked with AJ, and, and most importantly, the city manager, and said, we need to do some work to get competitive and uh, the city manager authorized us to um, increase our, our hiring bonus and other incentives to get people, uh, to lure people in. And I can tell you within two weeks, we had four people on the lateral list. And within the next month, we're gonna be fully staffed with lateral officers, two of which have, uh, well, one has 18 years experience, the other has 22 years of experience and then two uh, less experienced guys, but over three to five years. So we're gonna be in uh, really good shape. Uh, and it was uh, primarily because of uh, the willingness of the city manager to work with us to, to open that up. So I think that's it. Uh, we, interagency collaboration, I think you guys know we work with anybody that'll work with us. Those are force multipliers for us to help keep the city safe. And uh, so we work with, with everybody. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody have any questions for the chief? He can answer from there. Uh, well, chief, I just wanna say thank you for everything. You're, you've done a fantastic job and uh, obviously, you know, the elephant in the room is your reti pending retirement, but we wholeheartedly, on behalf of the city, thank you for everything you've done for this community. All right, um, seeing none, we will move on to the courts, court system, right? Legal department. Legal department, okay. we have Tara. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Tara Vaughn. I'm one of the city's prosecuting attorneys. Uh, I'll be presenting on legal department today. Uh, we are headed by the city attorney, who's the city's uh, chief legal advisor. Uh, we represent the city in all matters in the courts and provide general legal advice to all departments. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have two divisions, civil and criminal. Um, the civil division's main functions are to write uh, formal legal opinions, ordinances and resolutions, as well as review contracts and real property instruments, and conduct legal research. In that regard, we are the clearinghouse for all of the department's actions, working collaboratively with city departments in order to ensure laws are followed, actions are taken in a consistent manner, and potential liability is reduced whenever possible. So this generally means that increased workloads for other cities or other departments translates into additional workload for legal. It also means that we measure our success by other departments' successes. Um, next slide. Um, for the criminal division, our main functions are to um, handle all aspects of criminal and certain civil cases within the city. We do review all misdemeanor police reports for filing decisions and uh, the filing of criminal complaints when warranted. Last year we filed, filed 416 new criminal cases for Des Moines. 
we represent the city at all pre and post-trial hearings. That would be arraignments, pre-trials, motion hearings, review hearings. Uh, we represent the city at trials, both bench and jury, and civil cont uh, contested civil infraction hearings. Um, those include impound hearings, your tow hearings, dog, uh, dangerous dog hearings, traffic violation hearings, and uh, code enforcement, which we've heard quite a bit about today. Uh, we also negotiate uh, plea deals with the public defenders and private attorneys. We work uh, with the police department to make sure that we're all aware of legal and law updates and that we're working together to effectively and efficiently ensure public safety. Um, the goals there on the right hand side, uh, the main goal of prosecution in particular is public and or victim safety. Um, this is the primary goal. Working at the municipal level, we don't view many crimes as truly victimless. Even property crimes and quality of life crimes create an impact for the citizens of our city. Um, one of the other goals of prosecu uh, prosecution are deterrence, behavior modification, rehabilitation, and trying to tailor individual plea agreements towards preventing future crimes, aka reducing recidivism in our city. Uh, next slide, please. We do face a couple of challenges. Uh, they sort of tie into each other. Um, one is the current King County filing standards. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with what filing standards are, um, you can have a situation that essentially meets all of the elements of a felony level crime and a particular felony prosecutor's office have their own filing standards that determine whether they will actually charge that incident as a felony or not. If the case does not meet their filing standards, it will get declined and usually referred to the municipal prosecutor for possible misdemeanor charges. Um, this is okay in some instances and sometimes it's not. There are some crimes that can never be charged as misdemeanors. One example is motor vehicle theft. That is a class B felony. Um, we can't even charge an attempted motor vehicle theft because that would leave it at a class C felony. Um, so we are then forced to get fairly uh, creative in determining if there's uh, other charges that we can file. Similar to that, legislative changes have, uh, recent legislation has created hurdles to holding people account accountable and to effective prosecution. Um, and part of the problem of both of these is that people engaged in criminal activity are aware of this and they are emboldened by that because sometimes there are no consequences to their actions. That's all I have. I, yeah, I just one quick comment, you know, and the hardest part of my job is figuring out that I can't kind of call out any particular department for their excellence because all of you do it, so it's across the board, but um, our legal department, which is small, is so incredibly effective, and the advice that comes from that legal department, spearheaded by Tim, is just excellent. And so all of your efforts are just outstanding, but then you know you can you get to match that along with our public safety and the police department, and now we'll hear from the court and, and it's at the same level. And so we are so well served by, by the, the, especially on the judicial piece, public safety, but that's not to say that everyone who preceded that were not well served by those either. So, but I just wanna call it out, Tara, thank you. Thank you. My hat's off to you too. Just gonna to say, got a tough job. All right, uh, I am Lisa Leone. I am your municipal court judge. And um, put succinctly, the role of the court uh, is to provide for the fair, impartial, and timely administration of justice. To do so, however, requires not just the judge, but a team of well-trained court employees who understand and are committed to the court's mission and who work cooperatively with the judge every day to maintain the public trust and confidence in our court system. Currently, the court has 10 full-time employees 
one part-time and one extra hire. Uh, there's been discussion earlier of succession planning that was done, I don't know if it was last year or year before, but that has worked as planned in that I was fortunate enough to promote from within when two of our most senior positions became vacant last year. Uh, Melissa Patrick, who's formerly our support services manager, was promoted to director of court administration. She will also serve as our DUI court coordinator going forward. Oqua Lewis, who was one of our senior court clerks, was promoted to court operations supervisor, and she will be overseeing the technical aspects of our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, these promotions were well-deserved, and um, because we had succession planning in place and they were both more than adequately trained, um, both immediately hit the ground running in their new roles. Um, the court recently filled two court clerk vacancies and will be onboarding two more FTEs later this month, uh, which you can go to the next so slide, brings us to our, the court's primary uh, objective in the first half of this year. Uh, similar to other city departments, hiring is only the beginning. The next step is to ensure that all new hires are adequately trained. Um, so given all of our new hires, as well as change in senior management, uh, team building will be a primary goal for the next several months. Um, taking the time to do that team building, as we all know, encourages communication, mitigates conflict, builds trust, and increases collaboration among team members. And we will achieve this through team retreats, ongoing team building exercises, and other training opportunities. Uh, with an energized and motivated team, we can better serve the community. Um, next, I'll talk about the transition to hybrid court, which is both an opportunity and a challenge. Um, as you all know, having the ability to move court hearings online was key to our ability to maintain continuity of operations throughout the pandemic. After nearly three years of experience with virtual court, and as we open back up fully to the public, we intend to retain um, the best of the virtual court options for many types of hearings and cases, including traffic and camera tickets, as well as pretrial hearings in many criminal cases. However, physical presence before the judge is necessary for critical stages in criminal cases, such as, for example, arraignment, probation revocation, or plea and sentencing hearings. So the first step in our hybrid journey was rethinking how we calendar all of our many cases that we hear on uh, every single day. Uh, we did solicit input from attorneys on both sides of the aisle, and the aim was to increase hearing capacity while still ensuring that each case had adequate time uh, for a full and fair hearing. The next step was to update uh, our shared space here, which serves both as council chambers and the courtroom. Um, I greatly appreciate the executive branch working cooperatively with us on the changes. Special shout out to Bonnie, who worked closely with Melissa to ensure we ended up with an updated, more modern, and dare I say, a calming vibe, which I would argue works well for both court hearings and city council meetings. But I digress. Um, so the next challenge on this journey is to ensure that all parties can seamlessly switch between virtual hearings and in-person hearings. Um, this requires a significant upgrade of our audio and video technology, and um, that is in process. Uh, the city attorney's office, our public defenders, and court users have been exceedingly patient as we make this transition and troubleshoot along the way. Um, items three and four, um, I, I'm not, I don't want to go too in depth because I've already talked about um, a therapeutic court. I've also previously talked about um, DUI court, and I guess there's a, a couple things I would say about this. Um, I recently read a law review article that referred to municipal courts as laboratories for innovative approaches to justice tailored to the communities they serve. 
and uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I have had the opportunity, as I said, to speak in greater detail about the use of therapeutic approaches uh, in addressing serious substance use disorder or mental health challenges of those individuals accused or convicted of crimes. Uh, the best available research tells us that therapeutic interventions when coupled with count accountability yields the best outcomes in terms of treatment compliance and reduced rates of recidivism. Uh, the court is fortunate. Um, there are many municipal courts who do not have this, um, but our court is fortunate to have a support services department. And what that means is that we have the ability to offer various programs here at the courthouse at low or no cost, thereby removing one or more of the typical barriers to successful compliance with supervision. Moreover, because we have support services specialists, in the event of non-compliance, um, the parties, all of the parties, including myself, are immediately notified. And when I say immediately, I mean uh, it could be the same, same day that they learn of the non-compliance, um, or certainly within 24 to 48 hours. This, in turn, allows the court to take immediate action. Um, it's also worth noting that because we have support services supervising individuals, the court is also made aware when someone is fully complying. Um, I believe it is important for the judge to acknowledge those successes in open court to encourage further compliance and lifelong change. Uh, also, even those who are not on active supervision, even if their case is dismissed or closed, any justice-involved individual may talk to a support services specialist to get information on how to access additional resources. Um, and the city attorney spoke about uh, public safety. Obviously, that is first and, and foremost in uh, the court's duty as well. So when I talk about a therapeutic approach in appropriate cases, uh, that is what I am referring to. There are not all cases in which a therapeutic approach or intervention is going to be successful. And so the trick is trying to take the resources we have and um, carefully um, apply them to cases where we think uh, we would see those outcomes. Beyond that, another current objective, excuse me, given that we have been online for so long and now that we are returning, we are opening our doors back up, is we really want to focus on offering um, customer, the highest quality customer service. Um, this means additional training and reviewing and updating procedures. It also means that we train our court team not only in the basic principles of good customer service, but also in de-escalation techniques, implicit bias, and cultural competency. Although individuals may not, for a host of reasons, ever choose to be in court, it is my responsibility as the judge to make sure that the courthouse is as accessible and welcoming as possible to all those who have business here and to ensure or guarantee that every individual is treated with dignity and respect. Next slide. We can talk about the challenges, and I'm gonna start, I spoke about the challenges with the hybrid model, um, given that we're still in the process of upgrading audio and, um, and visual equipment. Um, and number four, the onboarding training new employees. Um, I also addressed that at the top of this presentation. Um, again, these are examples of issues that pre uh, present both opportunities and challenges. Um, I want to move down to the bottom, adequate space for staff. That is um, really an ongoing challenge. The court requires office space uh, for 10 full-time employees, uh, for, well, for all our employees, but we have 10 full-time employees. Uh, we do have a rotating remote policy, um, and we are really doing our level best to make do with the space allotted, and I know that we are not alone in this challenge. I know that there are other city departments who are similarly challenged. Um, but I thought it was important to raise just to keep it on the radar, especially if there's any future discussion regarding relocating or expanding city hall space. Um, now I'll go back to the first one, legislative and ongoing procedural changes. 
So whenever there is a significant change in the law or in the court rules that govern procedures in the court, it can impact court operations in ways both large and small. And once a new law or rule is enacted, the court is duty bound to follow it. Um, in the words of Yoda, there is no try, only do, uh, regardless of the impacts. And um, gosh, I thought I'd get a laugh out of that, wow. I know, it's a long night. Okay, good, thanks. <laughs> throw something in there. Um, so currently, uh, the legislature is debating competing bills related to drug possession, some of which, though well-intentioned, would create significant challenges um, for the court. And uh, Madam Prosecutor touched on that in her presentation. Um, and then lastly, I'll address the felony decline policy. I want to make very clear that any and all charging decisions are within the authority of the executive branch by way of the prosecutor. So the court has no role in the charging decisions, um, but the court can only speak to the impacts that a policy like this has. And in this court, um, what it has resulted in is uh, increased number of cases that I think any practicing criminal attorney would read the police report, whether it's domestic violence or a theft case, and say, wow. Yeah, this really is a felony, but it's being filed in this court. So um, with that, I uh, will conclude, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Uh, oh, well, I don't call. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, the pandemic uh, made it really challenging to comply with the uh, speedy trial rules. How is this court doing at this point? Uh, in, in, you know, respecting people's rights to a speedy trial? Um, we are back on track. Anybody who wants a speedy trial gets it. I mean, that doesn't mean that we're not overset frequently okay. um, with trials, in which case, you know, they might be set over. But uh, most recently when we've been overset, we've had everything either settle um, or go to trial within the time limits prescribed, you know, by the Constitution and the court rules. Great, thank you. Mayor Buxton. I just want to say, as Yoda would say, appreciate you. <laughs> we do. <laughs> thank you. Any, any others before we move on? Yeah. Council Member Harris. Thank you, Judge. Um, on a tip, what's a typical number of cases that you will field on a, you know, average docket, four hours? Um, I can tell you probably. Let's see, three sixteen. Carry the five. On yeah. Three in the I love the specificity. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that doesn't include um, our in custody jail calendar, and then there's more also on days when we are handling um, uh, traffic, the traffic calendar. There's more on those days as well. I bet. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you, Judge. Yeah. You do a wonderful job, and your and your staff too. Yeah. We appreciate your efforts. And Judge, you have to forgive me, but every time, it's always better for you to appear before us. <laughs> for us to appear before you. Uh, okay, sorry. So I think we're going to move on to the marina, Scott. Uh, thank you, City Manager, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council, Scott Wilkins, your Harbor Master at the Marina. I'm here tonight with Ashley Young, our Events and Facilities Manager. We kind of, the Mayor spoke early at the very beginning that there's about 80 slides and I feel a little hoggish. I think we're about 20 of them, so we'll get through this for you. But as you can see, the new uh, inlay at the Des Moines Marina looks fabulous. I thank you all that made it yesterday to come look at it. Andrew and his crew did a fabulous job. I do want to point one thing out. To the west of that inlay, 
there you can see a little line in the wall, a couple lines in the walls. Those are, and uh, Andrew helped with the design of that and everything else, and those are removable sections. So in case of an emergency, things that are needed, we can come by waterway, we can actually remove part of that wall to, to barge in equipment, supplies, whatever that might be necessary. So really, it, there's a lot that went into this whole entire marina design. Next slide, please. Some facts about our marina. We have a fishing pier, it offers great fishing, crabbing, squid fishing, bird watching, and some and fabulous photo opportunities. We now have over 13 foot wide sidewalks that provides that connectivity from the water into the beach park, that recreational use areas, the promenade, the meadow uh, for the kayakers and the windsurfers you see out there all the time. And the new north, like I say, the new north parking lot supports our emergency management. We can land helicopters. The, the lights out there are spaced in a, in, a, in a spacing that you can land helicopters with ease. I just spoke about the emergency vessel docking. The marina the, uh, north parking lot provides that connectivity right up 216th down 24th to the SeaTac airport, staying off Highway 99 in the freeways. We also home, we are home to the South King Fire and Rescue new boat. Love that thing. It's awesome. And we also are home to the King County Police Vessel. Some of our environmental protections, we, do, we work with Trout Unlimited in the state to do salmon rearing each year. We have other wildlife habitat. We work with uh, the Mass Center. They come down and do night classes. It's kind of fun to see, shine lights in the water at night and see what kind of marine life there is. We also work with the UW. Uh, we have some mussel cages throughout our marina for that they do what they do and also we help with uh, doing some water quality monitoring over in the, in the creek, so we're really happy for that. We have the Department of Fish and Wildlife vessel within our marina also, and they you know, help us out with compliance and things. Some of our uh, marine facilities, we have the dock to support the fast ferry taxi. Uh, we have an, the dock there that showcases Ranger Tugs and their new vessels, one of the largest selling boat manufacturers in the U.S. We have some dining venues, Anthony's Home Port and the Quarter Deck, and we're home to SR3 and CSR Boatyard. And CSR Boatyard has been with us about 25 years now. We're really happy to have them. Scott, if I may add to that, Please. also we I believe we also have the um, mortgage for the uh, Maritime High School. Yes, yeah, we do. We also each year the summer they bring down. Oh, Captain Jack, I think it's called, I'm sorry. And yes, we supply the water mortgage for them and that's fun to see, it's fun to see. Thank yes. you. These quick pictures are actually the uplands. They don't include the water. This is the uplands that the marina staff takes care of every single day. The, the marina there, the, on the right-hand side is the Redondo boardwalk, fishing piers, bathrooms, parking lots, the fishing pier itself at the marina. And then we do the beach park and the beach park trail every single day. Thank you. Uh, for those that don't know, the marina is an enterprise fund, meaning the marina must be self-sustaining. The revenues earned from marina services, such as fueling, moorage, and stuff, must not exceed the combined total of all of our expenses, which are salaries, repairs, bonds, all that stuff. No general fund money helps support our marina, and no property taxes help support our marina. Thank you. Our team at the marina, we have 10 employees that work for the marina, harbor master, the assistant harbor master, Katie, two office specialists, Tara and Andrea, two harbor leads, Jeff and Pat, environmental specialist, Jonathan, three harbor attendants, Dave, Travis, and Sean, and we usually try to hire one or two summer helps during the summer season with the high demand on fueling and guest mortgage. The marina services and maintenance staff also operates as essential staff. We have a fuel dock on the on marine waterways, so we were considered as an essential staff when COVID began, and we continue to do so. We also help out with inclement weather and any other emergency events. We work closely with the other city departments, our public works team, our engineering, legal, we use Tim and Matt all the time, <laughs> police department, finance, human resources, emergency management and of course our city administration. We also work closely with South King Fire and Rescue and the Department of Fish and Wildlife for any emergencies that happen throughout the marina or, or close to Puget Sound there. What we do, we maintain in 14 docks, open and covered docks. 
we, sorry, apologize. We have, we have 77 dry sheds and 40 lockers we oversee. We have 30 to 35, depending on the size of boats in our guest moorage facility. We have very busy fuel dock, especially in the summertime. We have three pump out facilities. We have tenant restrooms, public restrooms that we clean daily. We have the public fishing pier. We have the marina floor. We have the beach park. And then we have the Redondo Boardwalk parking facilities and restrooms down there. Thank you. The marina maintains a 24 hour day, seven day a week operation. We work a lot of holidays. People like to go boating on Labor Day, 4th of July, Memorial Day, so we're there. We're there 10 to 12 hours a day. Six service men, they work uh, two shifts, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So we have three full-time employees there each day. Wednesday's kind of an, a doubled up day, which helps us get some projects done. Uh, we have the emergency management there. We, uh, we have a spill trailer that was given to us by the state, has about 200 feet of hard boom, a lot of soft oil absorbent booms, fire extinguishers, life vests, anchors and chains, floating buoys, navigational aids, and we're ready to be pulled out anytime that need be if we have an emergency. Our office staff maintains approximately 1,100 active accounts this is mortgage agreements, record storage, wait lists, leases such as the quarter deck, CSR boat yard, SR3. We have all the temporary guest mortgages that come down, commercial vendors such as divers and boat mechanics and things like that. We have yacht clubs that come every season. We have our government such as our fire and police and all those. We have tribal vessels. Right now we have, I think there's seven Puyallup gooey duck boats. So if you come down the marine about three o'clock, you'll see milk crates with hundreds and hundreds of gooey ducks. It's pretty cool. Uh, and then we have, we work with the, like the Coast Guard, the Mass Center, and the Maritime High School. Our customer service, we just serve both the boating community and the non-boating community. Our, over here on the right, our daily operations, this is every day, it's not limited to this, but just a few. We do clean our own bathrooms. We clean 10 individual restrooms. We open, we empty approximately 31 individual trash cans every single day. We do our dock repair maintenance by pressure washing, board replacement, refloating dock fingers. And over the last month and a half, we've installed 350 55 gallon barrels underneath the fingers of some of the docks that are starting to lose their flotation. So it's pretty, that's a lot of work. We maintain the daily cleaning of the Redondo's boardwalk, the janitorial down there, and the parking lots. We take care of all the marina landscaping and at Redondo also. Our fueling, we help with also the fuel pump out, the pump out services. We don't, we don't hire anything else out. We do all our own in-house carpentry, electrical, plumbing, upgrading and repairs. Our account, our uh, office does all the account rec reconciliation and updating the websites and all of our social media. And then each year we go down with the new harbor boats and the old harbor boats and pull out the Redondo docks and install them again each year. We try to get them in before Memorial Day and we take them right out at the end of September, early October before the storms kick in. Some of the agencies we have to work with all the time are local, city, and county, state, federal, the fisheries, environmental protection. That's where our fuel system. Um, we also are EnviroStar Enviro certified, it means we're a clean marina, we're a green marina. We earn that recognition by the recycling programs we do and also the preparedness that we have with our spill response stuff and everything. So we're real proud to be that. Uh, next, please. These are what all the, all the staff have. They're all first aid CPR certified, AED certified. They all have their boater's license. They have their forklift certificates. They have their flagger certificates. Some people go, on the water? What do you need a flagger certificate for? Well, we like to make sure we can help other departments. If the police need someone to come flag an accident or something, or the public works are down a few people and need that, we're there to help out. We think it's important to help other departments. We have a 20, 25 ton travel lift. Everybody has that certification to pull those 40 and 50 foot boats out if necessary. 
everybody carries a commercial driver's license, A endorsement. And like we said before, why on the water? Well, we like to go, we don't like to interrupt the public works department so we can go up and get a dump truck, go down and get a load of bark. We can help out if there's a snow event. That's what we're here for. We also have Shannon that makes sure we have our FEMA courses and everything in place. And then we're, we have courses that we take through NOAA and the fire department and the Coast Guard for our oil spill and response training. Plus a couple of us down there are also scuba certified if need be. Some of our capital improvements. We have our guest mortgage electrical that we're doing right now. We should have, we have uh, an inspection on Wednesday with, this, with RCO that gave us the grant for this and they'll be down to see our 50%. This is upgrading all of our pedestals and guest mortgage to 50 amp and 30 amp service along with putting in the backbone, as we stated before, for electric charging vessels. Not knowing exactly yet what those type of hookups are, we're at least getting the backbone in there for it. The tenant restroom replacement, big price tag, still working on it. I had a person give me a, uh, some paperwork for a modular restroom, such as you see in some of the parts, so we can see how that might work out. A Redondo South uh, boarding float dock replacement, that's in process right now. We hope to have them in before this year. The fuel delivery system, that was last year. And we're working on the dock replacement for LM and N right now. We're also pleased that we got to support the North, Bulk, the North Bulkhead replacement project and the restroom project. And we're working closely with the marina steps and the feasibility analysis. Some future projects coming up. The, adaptive purpose building or the dry stack building, the utility backbone that needs to go from ADOC to KDOC, the seawall replacement, get rid of all the creosote seawall that has been failing and we've been patching, um, the pest, and which will, at the same time we will do the pedestrian and walkway sidewalks which will mirror the north parking lot and in front of the marina. Big wide sidewalks, some artwork, benches, landscaping, looking for that. The alternative vessel launching option what that is for is, as we learn more about the dry stack, we'll be looking at, do we replace the rail system launch that we have for our smaller boats right now, or do we look at a negative lift forklift, they call it, where you can pick a, fork, pick a boat off a rack, go to the seawall, and actually drop it below the seawall and into the water. So we're looking at all the different options and how they would work out and support each other. Then we'll be replacing ADOC through KDOC, and then down the road, we have fuel tank upgrades to redo. Some of our marina challenges. Biggest challenge is our parking system. The machinery no longer functions well, and it doesn't, we can't find parts, and it's not supported by the vendor, which it's kind of impacting our security at the marina. Our solution, we have three quotes now. I'm gonna send staff out to actually physically look at each and one, each one of these to make sure that this is, that's gonna work in our environment. They know what does work. They know what does not work. They've been working on them for years. So I feel it best that they go out and actually physically see these things. Uh, some of our, another challenge is just the age of our facility, the docks, 50 some years old, the Harbor Master's office, we've outgrown it. There's six guys downstairs. Three of them have all their offices and their computers and all their stuff in the lunchroom. Three of them have them in an office, and we have seven employees in the upstairs because we have the events and facilities within our department. So we've kind of outgrown that, and the dry sheds need lots of repairs. So we're working on the dock replacement, planning for the future infrastructure, and we'll continue our ongoing maintenance to keep things as best as we can. One of the Redondo challenges we feel is staffing. With, three, with only three employees at the marina each day, you can be at the fuel dock for hours if someone's taking on thousands of gallons of fuel. You can be cleaning a lot, so we don't have a lot of time that we can spend at Redondo. We get down there, we clean things, we empty things, we check parking, we do whatever. So I think a, a, for us, a good solution would be looking at hiring a seasonal full-time or two to manage that location, especially during the summer months to help with parking, help with the boat launch, and just keep the facility tip-top shape. And I think that was my last slide. Yes, it is. So this is Ashley, unless there's any questions.
Any questions for Scott before we move on to Ashley? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Ashley Young. I am the Events and Facilities Manager. Uh, events and Facilities reports directly to the marina, a little bit unusual for our city, but um, largely due to proximity. As you can see, the marina is incredibly helpful with the beach park facilities. Um, we have two additional full-time, well, a little bit of background. I come from a background in advertising and public relations. I've been working in hospitality since I was nine, slinging coffee for my parents at a coffee shop. And I've been managing events since 2015, but I've been doing it for much longer than that. Uh, we also have Courtney Wilt. She joined us in June of 2021. Her experience is in program and event coordination, um, an extensive background in hospitality. She comes from food and beverage, hotels, and has worked in historic facilities. We also recently just hired Robert Thomas. Um, he hails from Missouri via Oregon and um, moved to Washington just to take this position. Um, we're very fortunate to have him. He has a background in parks and recreation management and has also worked at historical facilities like the Beach Park in the past. Uh, we also employ approximately five, um, in an ideal world, 15 yearly seasonal staff to help with our events. Um, they do everything from um, helping lead our events with Courtney and Rob, um, drive shuttles, do parking management, and set up and tear down facilities. Next slide, please. Um, our primary function is to operate City of Des Moines rental facilities for public, private, and community events. Um, those facilities include the Beach Park Event Center, which is a historical facility, has access to the meadow, three indoor facilities, and a picnic shelter. Um, we can have probably anywhere from 300 to 2,000 people at the Beach Park on a big event day. Um, it is located 15 minutes from the SeaTac Airport and 30 minutes from Seattle, Tacoma, and Bellevue, making it a great facility for um, people looking outside of Des Moines as a location for their gatherings. Um, that's the dining hall, auditorium, Founders Lodge, and Meadow. We also have park shelter locations that we rent out, Wooten Park, Field House Park, Soundview Park, and the Beach Park Event Center has its own picnic shelter. Um, when we have staffing capabilities, we also will manage the uh, private events at the Field House, the Activity Center. Um, we do limit it at the Activity Center right now, and we have not been able to uh, staff up enough to do the Field House since COVID. We hope to get to a place where we can in the future. We also manage all of the events that take place on the marina floor. And so when we say the marina floor, we're talking about the parking lot. So for example, the farmer's market, Ram Fest, which is a booster club for Mount Rainier, event that happens every year and large events like Wheels and Keels. And then we also have that little sculpture park next to SR3. There have been some events there in the past and we're hoping that we can market it to people as an ideal location for the future. Um, some additional functions of our department is we promote and market City of Des Moines rental facilities. Um, for example, celebrations of life, company events, community events, festivals. Every event is very unique. Um, no two events are alike. And even an event that occurs annually can have significant changes from year to year. We um, ensure compliance for all of the events hosted on our property. And just a few examples uh, are Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Control Board permits and licenses, insurance coverage, um, health, health permits and licenses from the health department and fire inspections from South King Fire and Rescue. Um, we also coordinate the routing of special event permits. Um, Special events are a way to make our city a destination city. So the coordination of these events and these permits are a way for us to grow and have people find us as a desirable location. We hold large events like Rotary's Blues and Brews Festival, um, recycle events that happen either at the Activity Center or at the Marina. 
uh, the farmer's market, Destination Des Moines events, and then the Wakulima USA Mavuno Festival that happens at Marigate Park and is a collaboration with um, Highline College. We also um, have managed the mobile food vendor pilot program. Um, everybody knows it as food trucks, but we're kind of trying to walk away from that because we're discovering that people serve food not just inside of trucks, but in several different ways, trailers, tables, tents, et cetera. Um, our finance director, Jeff Friend, mentioned that we were in the process of signing a contract with the Washington State Food Truck Association. That contract has recently been signed. Um, we are undergoing site inspections with them currently, and they will help us develop a pilot program for uh, mobile food vendor operations. And then they'll also recommend some code adjustments for future operations within the city. Uh, another function that we have is we support the Des Moines Arts Commission. Um, the Des Moines Arts Commission, as you know, holds several um, arts and culture programs within our city. We have a truly fantastic commission. It's a small yet mighty commission, is what I say these days, but some of those functions are uh, of the staff are creating and managing the budget, create program scopes, execute contracts, coordinate programs and events, and attend and work those events. And um, also, we do a lot of training. Um, as you can see, it's really important throughout all the departments that have presented today for there to be training for our employees. So um, we do have things such as CPR training, driver's training, um, and emergency response training. Next slide, please. Um, to kind of elaborate more on the Arts Commission, so we, um, some of the events are the Summer Concert Series, that's an eight week concert series in the Beach Park on the meadow there. Theater in the Park, that's anywhere from two to three outdoor theater programs in the summer. Squidorama, which is a collaborative event with the Mass Center, held at their aquarium every November. Um, squidding is a really huge feature of our city. It's a very deeply cultural experience um, for those who live around our region, and squidding season is a really, really big deal. So it's really fun that we get to support something so cultural and unique to our city, and we add the education and science element with the Mass Center. Um, our recently developed utility box art program, we have five wrapped boxes. We're working on additional five right now. Um, arts grants, and the sculpture program. Um, we also uh, assist with special events such as the 4th of July celebration and Stormfest. These are City of Des Moines hosted events. We also assist with city meetings like department meetings and retreats. Uh, the ribbon cutting, Rob supplied all the tables and chairs, microphone, etc., for the ribbon cutting this week did a fantastic job and canine training with our department and also other agencies such as the Coast Guard, Air Force, um, and other cities. They use um, the Beach Park facility as a canine training location. Um, we also network and collaborate with a lot of outside organizations. Um, it's actually one of my favorite things to do is to connect people. So I feel like it's kind of one of my special gifts um, is if um, I know two people that could really help and benefit each other, I like to, to you know, e email, greet, and say, hey, you guys can help each other out. And so some of those organizations we work with are the Seattle Southside Regional Tourism Authority, uh, the Seattle Southside Chamber District Events Committee, the Des Moines Waterfront Farmers Market, the Burning Boat Festival, which was a collaboration between um, Amy Cook Thomas, South King Fire and Rescue Aid Fund, and the Des Moines Police Guild, and What's Up Des Moines. Um, and also we will, uh, we help with tourism promotion. So this year we will begin attending conferences in other regions to, um, and states to promote Des Moines as a destination location. Um, including the uh, National Tour Association Travel Exchange in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, that is a conference that brings travel professionals together and is a hosted sponsorship program 
with the Seattle Southside Regional Tourism Authority. And then we're also assisting this year with some of the marketing for the fast water taxi. So what is success and how do we get there and what does that look like? Here are some of our guiding principles to help us do that. We actively pursue alternative revenue generating opportunities. Um, in regards to private events, we always are considering our pricing and staying consistent with the private sector. Um, we find ways to maximize the use of the marina and the beach park facilities. That could include weekday rentals, festivals, conferences, things that people would think are out of the norm for the type of events that we normally host. Um, we're always trying to be competitive in the market, and that's something that we're emphasizing more and more each year. Um, and then we want to be creative in marketing, working with organizations and corporations um, and other entities to increase knowledge of our facilities, creating unique ad campaigns to diverse markets, and keeping up with trends in marketing, such as the virtual tours that we offer during COVID. Challenges and solutions. Uh, I think we've heard pretty much across the board that staffing is a big challenge. Limited FTEs, uh, full-time staff, excuse me, and, and very inconsistent part-time staff during our peak season. Um, we run a lot of events and we do a lot of stuff and we have very few people to do it. Um, we're a very, very hardworking team, but things can get spread thin at times, and it's really important that we provide really great quality of service. Um, some solutions were hiring of Robert Thomas um, in November 2022 for the coordinator assistant. Um, that was a great collaboration with the HR department. On That was a created position, so they were really essential in helping us be successful there. Um, last year, we started working with Highline College and their host program, that's their hospitality program, to recruit their students as interns. Um, they have internship requirements as a part of their program, and we're happy to assist with that. And these are all paid internships um, as extra hires. Um, it would be uh, some other solutions could include additional full-time or intern support for arts and cultural programs and events. Um, and working with human resources to find ways to make positions more desirable. They've already done a great job doing that, adding pictures, um, using words to entice people to come and work for our facilities. Um, other challenges are special event permits. It's quite an outdated system. We still use a paper application. Uh, the guidelines are pretty unclear, unfortunately, and can have never really been developed. And there's no source of revenue when it comes to processing special event permits. That currently is done at no charge to the applicant. Um, so some solutions are, and this is an ongoing process that's in the works right now, is we're in the process of creating an online application. It's very much in the beta stage. It's an intensely collaborative process. We, when we route event permits, they go to almost every single department in the city, including other outside agencies such as FIRE and um, the LCB. And so we have been working really hard with all of the different departments and agencies to make sure that we're covering all of our grounds when we're processing these permits. Um, the goals here are to create an um, some equability for our applicants, um, making clear guidelines and practices, um, and we're making an, or we're recommending some fee schedules for the application and for some city services. Um, we want to make event organizers want to be in Des Moines, um, and we want to create revenue to support the department that will lead to more opportunities to hire staff in the future. And, support events in a larger way. Just a second. Uh, council, <clears throat> we're coming up on nine o'clock, and uh, I, I think what we do is we get somebody to make a motion for an hour. I don't think we'll t take that long, but we don't have to extend past that point, but we make a motion till 10. As I'll, a, I'll move that we extend the meeting as late as 10. As late as 10. Do I have a second? Second. Alrighty, okay. All those in favor? All those opposed? I see it 5-2, motion passes.
All right. Well, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. No, no problem. I felt a feeling it was coming, so <laughs> it's all good. Um, all right. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, some more challenges is our events management system. Um, the system that we use is not geared towards events. It's actually geared towards parks and rec programs. And as much as we love our partners at parks and rec, um, having a system of our own would be really beneficial. Um, we uh, have used paper folders um, and customer communication is not very cohesive. We often are using multiple systems to support events. Um, this industry requires a lot of organization, attention to detail, and very high levels of communication. So um, finding solutions for this is very important. Um, so our solution is going all digital um, as much as we can anyways. I think we've gotten to about 90% digital at this point. Um, we also are looking to implement new customer relations management systems that are geared towards our event to help um, provide communication, contracts, floor plans, payment options, marketing, and reporting. Another challenge we have is revenue. Um, our department's revenue does not equate to our expenditures, and although we have seen an increase in revenue, our expenditures still remain higher. Um, some solutions that we've already put into practice is increasing our rates. Uh, in 2022, we did a rate increase of 5%. In 2023, we did a rate increase of 20%. When I did my market research, we were seeing that venues in 21 and 22 were doing 25% rate increases. So we started really, um, um, really low just to kind of get a feel for it, but decided to pull the trigger this year so that we could be more competitive. Um, we're also looking to provide a higher standard of service to go with those rate increases and to also bring in a higher demographic of clientele. Um, some other solutions would be making significant updates to our facilities to support the cost of services, such as the Founders Lodge, where the infrastructure uh, is significantly needing some repair on the siding, a floor replacement for old carpeted floors that have been there probably since 1986. Um, some window replacements, the windows are beautiful and they're historic to the building. Um, so having those replaced would be nice, some um, exterior and interior painting. And then also the Sun Home Lodge. I don't know if everybody even knows it exists. It's behind the auditorium. You have to actually walk past the auditorium to find the Sun Home Lodge. Um, it's also on the historical registry, but adding a commercial kitchen and some additional meeting spaces would make the auditorium also more desirable as a rental facility. And then finding um, other revenue sources to support additional support services. Next slide, please. Additional challenges. Scott touched on the office space. Um, we. I don't know if anybody's been in the marina lately, but it's bustling. We've got a walk-up counter for tenants, um, residents, community members that have questions. We often have people on Zoom meetings, meeting with clients, doing trainings, classes. We also have people on the phone taking sales calls, working on leases. And we don't even have a space for having private meetings. We have to kick Scott out of his office sometimes so that we can have some private meetings from time to time. And we're very grateful that he's so generous with that. Um, so we've been working on a solution of a temporary modular unit on the marina floor. Um, we've just been doing some basic uh, preliminary research on this, but we're moving forward to see what that option would look like for us. Um, another challenge, the Arts Commission workload. Um, as I stated earlier, we've got a small but mighty arts commission, um, which means that we don't have enough volunteers to sit on our commission. We have the ability to have nine seats full, and we currently have two, are working on a third, um, which means that it's turned into a primarily advisory committee. Um, you'll see that when it comes to volunteers, people's priorities have shifted um, and they no longer want to take on the workload. They're happy to participate, but they want to do it from more of an advisory position. And when that happens, it increases the workload on staff. 
And also it would be um, ideal to create a revenue stream to support arts and culture programs, something that's consistent, something that we can track um, for the future. Um, some sol solutions that we've come up with um, would be to allocate dedicated staff for arts and culture programs, perhaps in the form of an intern or an FTE. Um, and in regards to the workload, we have this year developed a grant program or are in the process of developing a grant program to offer some uh, um, to offer outside organizations. And this has the possibility of doing three things. Um, a, we'll connect the Des Moines, uh, the city of Des Moines and the commission with other organizations and creating a larger and stronger arts and culture community. It would give the commission and the city the opportunity to support those organizations and programs that would otherwise not been able to ha um, have their own programs or events. And it would take some of the workload off of the staff to create more programs. Last slide, I promise. All right, mobile food vendor program. Um, this has been a program that's going on since before my time, several years in fact, um, and I'm grateful that Shannon is still here for me to pick her brain from time to time. Um, the challenge is recruiting, permitting, and scheduling vendors. It is a full-time job. There are so many compliances that go into that, insurance, health permits, um, fire inspections, business licenses, all of those are required for a uh, vendor to operate. And we've had little staff to dedicate to that program. Um, I'm really happy that we are in the process of the solution and we hope to see that come to life this year, working with the Washington State Food Truck Association. All right, and finally, maintenance and upkeep. Um, historical facilities are unique with their own special challenges and no one building is alike. They all have very different personalities and trust me, they've got big personalities. Um, and throughout the city, there's limited staff to help maintain them. We're very grateful to Public Works. They do a lot of work throughout our city and we're constantly asking for their assistance to help us with the beach park in particular. Um, and the Founders Lodge is in disrepair in need of some significant improvements as we spoke about earlier. Um, some solutions that we have attempted to work on in the past was apply for capital grants. Um, specifically, I worked on a grant back in 2021-22 from For Culture uh, for the Founders Lodge for a historical preservation grant. Uh, I asked for 200,000 and I was awarded five. Um, there's not a lot you can do with $5,000 when it comes to capital improvements. Um, they've been very great, gracious and flexible in trying to help, help me find ways to spend the money. Um, but we're looking for alternative solutions to help with that facility moving forward. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, Ashley. All right, questions or comments? Uh, Councilman Roxiger. Uh, yes, could you tell me, is the uh, farmer's market handled under uh, the events uh, department or is that under the marina? The events department is under the marina, so yes to both. Okay, thank you. Council Member Harris. Um, thank you, this was uh, excellent. I just was wondering on your list of challenges, I noticed you did not include parking. Um, how does it, um, I'm just always fascinated when I see events on a Saturday or Sunday. Um, how is that kind of, uh, I mean, is that a challenge or, uh, yeah. Yeah, parking is a, is a really big challenge um, and having limited staff to assist with parking management has been a really great challenge for us, especially last season. Um, everybody hit the ground running with events. They were built up and ready to party, and so we probably had one of our busiest event seasons to date. Um, a big way that we have addressed that challenge is um, limiting the number of events that are hosted on the beach park on a weekend. Again, trying to get a higher demographic to um, still assist with the dollars that we would like to see on Saturday and Sunday events. 
but limiting it to one event that has exclusive use of the property rather than three, four, or perhaps five events? So, Ashley, additionally, you know, it's great we'll have the water taxi service because people coming from Seattle are not going to be parking in Des Moines. The other thing is that as of yesterday, um, the North Bulkhead is once again available for parking, which is a huge addition of, um, of our parking stock. And we continue to pursue multimodal opportunities like the shuttle and ways to uh, address opportunities. Um, and in the end, there's a relatively finite a number of um, parking spots, but I think some creative use of the roadways, including Marine View Drive and 7th Avenue, could expand what the possibilities are. So the, all of those things are things that we're looking at uh, to uh, bring people here to spend money and enjoy the city. Yeah, thank you. Any others? Okay. Okay, we're gonna move on to emergency management. We have Shannon. Thank you, City Manager Matthias. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon Kirchberg. I am the Director of Emergency Management and Workplace Safety. Uh, I just wanna say, when I first took on the position of emergency management, uh, Vic Pennington told me that 97% of this job was preparedness and community outreach, and 3% was response. Still waiting for the 97%. So with COVID on the decline, not gone, um, emergency management is able to focus more on preparedness and community outreach, which is very exciting. So with emergency preparedness, staff training, which everybody loves with the National Incident Management System, we're actually branching out and we're gonna start working on some emergency operations center position specific training so that those that have been assigned to work in the, oper in the emergency operations center, um, instead of just having a vest, they will have a position task book with training specifications in order to meet the requirements for that position. So in times of response or activation of the EOC, we all know what we're doing and when we're doing it and how to do it. Community emergency response team working with our certs, building the cert team and getting more community engagement. Reaching out, uh, CPR, Stop the Bleed, and a new initiative with uh, King County. I was on the development team for a uh, new Get Ready King County, which is gonna replace our prepare in a year. So it'll be a emergency plan for individual households. And then we're gonna branch out and build a new one for businesses. So look for that coming soon. And then uh, partner relationships and networking. Working on grant applications, uh, public assistance reimbursement for COVID through the Federal Emergency Management Association uh, is finally complete. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later. And then I am excited to say our emergency management performance grant for 2024 will, will no longer, our portion will no longer be managed by King County. I finished the application with the state and they have graciously um, told us that we can now apply to receive our funding directly and we can manage the spending ourselves for community outreach and community preparedness. So we'll be filling that out and submitting that in June. Uh, working on a response planning, uh, hazard mitigation uh, plan is up for review and updating in 2023 and resubmittal to the county. Um, working on a response management plan, um, working with our public works team, uh, debris, I'm sorry, debris management plan. Uh, debris management is uh, across all emergency responses. Uh, so we thought this would be a great plan. Thank you for the siren. <laughs> We thought this would be a great plan to get on board. I planned that, yeah. thanks. Um, <laughs> going into workplace safety, uh, working with the safety committee, we meet monthly. Um, we have representation from all the departments in the room and we review all of the event reports that come in each month uh, to addre address safety concerns, not just in individual departments, but across the city as a whole. Accident prevention plan is due this year. We're working on a total rewrite, working with the Department of Labor and Industries to make sure that we have all of our I's dotted and T's crossed. 
Uh, staff training, working with all of the departments and making sure that all of their staff are trained in CPR first aid, driver safety, active shooter, hearing evaluations, and fire safety, just to name a few. In emergency management, uh, staff training, uh, like I said, the EOC training, we have our first class coming up in May. It's a three-day class. The second, third, and fourth, we're partnering with the city of Burien because we have uh, very similar, if not identical, EOC setups. Uh, so we're able to share that cost and spread it between the two cities. And then in the fall, hopefully in October, we'll be doing one-on-one -on -one spe position-specific training so that people get more direct um, training on their individual responsibilities in the EOC. We're preparing for an integrated emergency management course. Uh, King County has uh, filed for um, EMI, Emergency Management Institute, to come to King County uh, to do an integrated emergency management course with all partners within King County. So all cities and all partners will be able to open up their EOC and respond to an event um, in tandem and see how we can work together interdepartmentally, how our communication systems work together. This is just an EOC activation training. It's not a full activation, but it would be a great opportunity for us to do that. And if, we, if our application is accepted, we would be participating in this in either uh, 2024 or possibly 2025. Uh, next step, uh, comprehensive emergency management planning. Um, you know, we, we have a beautiful plan, now we just need to get the, the people in their chairs and put it to work, test it, update it, and keep it as a living, breathing, working document. CERT team engagement, we have about 15 people in the city of Des Moines that love their vests and helmets and really want to get to work, so we're building our CERT team. We meet quarterly up at the EOC, talk about what we're going to do. Um, for additional training and community outreach. So we're gonna start March 22nd. We're doing a full Red Cross CPR first aid training uh, with Park and Rec. Rochelle, Rochelle, one of our new hires, is uh, fully certified in CPR first aid training. And she's also lifeguard trainer certified, which is awesome, because our kids go to the pool and she'll be able to talk about water safety with those guys. Um, I will be getting uh, CPR certified this year, and then we're gonna ha let Kyle do it next year. Uh, we're partnering with South King Fire and Rescue for Stop the Bleed. Uh, we're gonna roll it out to the community, the CERT staff, as well as our team members. They wanna work on wildfire smoke community education and outreach, so we want to hand out KN95 masks to the community, talk to them about the hazards of fire, wildfire smoke in the air, how to check for air quality, and how to build their own home fan filter system. So when they turn their fan on, it cleans the air at the same time. That'll be a fun one. Watch for that. We're going to partner with the farmer's market, hopefully, and do that down there. Um, we're looking at doing, I keep saying we, it's me. Um, a CERT class at Highline College this summer. Uh, we did one a few years back and they want to do it again. So we're going to go and uh, do a CERT class up there over six weeks and get some more CERT trained Highline educators. And then in September, we'll be bringing it back to the community and doing a CERT class. We're looking at doing five Saturdays instead of spreading it over six weeks and doing it at night. People really don't like uh, working all day and then coming to a CERT training class, 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock, it was a little rough. So we're going to see if we can do a Saturday class and get more people engaged. And then emergency uh, management professional grant, that is the funding that comes from FEMA. It goes to the state for community outreach for preparedness. The state sends it to the county. The county sits around a big table, decides what they're going to spend the money on, and then we can ask for certain um, preparedness uh, supplies. We have gone to the state and said, we have a dedicated emergency manager. We have enough people in the community. We have enough staff that is engaged in emergency management. We would like to decide how our percentage of that funding is spent. And so we will fill out the application this June and hopefully we will start spending that money ourselves. Workplace safety, uh, accident prevention plan. Uh, uh, work with the safety committee. We updated, we're updating the existing plan. So hopefully uh, all things clicking, we'll get that done before the end of the year. 
Uh, I've been attending LNI trainings to ensure that all areas that are required to be in the plan are addressed. Uh, and then we're going to have LNI review the draft plan prior to its finalization just to make sure that um, it's perfect in every way. Staff training, uh, review the required training by position. Uh, every position has different training requirements. Um, and then we want to make sure that we're requiring all of the staff training, including we just finished active shooter. Uh, we had four different classes. Those that couldn't attend any of the four due to unforeseen circumstances, we had an online training that was available. It worked great. We're going to start doing fire drills. Uh, we do our emergency evacuation every October uh, during the Great Shakeout, and we need to do uh, fire safety training to include fire extinguisher training. And then we're also uh, CPR training. We've always outsourced it and been charged to have our staff trained, so we're bringing that in-house. We're going to start doing hands-only CPR with the majority of our staff and then those that are required to be fully uh, Red Cross CPR certified, first aid certified um, Rachel and I will be able to do that training in combination with an online class. And then our safety committee, we standardized our incident and event reporting process. It's now a fillable PDF that is saved to a shared drive that everybody has access to. So now when these reports come in, they are consistent. They all look exactly the same, um, and it's so much better. Um, and then we have a monthly safe safety checklist that we put in to works with our facilities department where we're checking our exit signs, our first aid kits, our fire extinguishers. But in addition, we're asking our safety committee members to also go through the checklist so we're getting a double dip each month um, because, you know, those batteries just die when they want to die. So it's nice to check them twice. And then we're going to work on promoting our safety slogan, uh, stay alert, don't get hurt citywide. Yay. Thanks, Shannon. Um, I think one thing to remember, you know, emergency management has obviously increased dramatically since 9-11. Um, and at the same time, the number of violent incidents in the country has increased just exponentially. And so even though in the, in the framework of emergency management, there's a lot of, um, you know, training, documents, sort of, um, sort of milestones along the way. In the end, and the only thing that really matters is that people understand they have a change in consciousness and a change in behavior. And that's what everything, all the effort that Shannon's talking about, both in workplace safety and emergency management, is designed to help people help themselves to be safe. And that's what this is all about. So with that, you've done a great job. Appreciate that. And now, um, after having heard all of this, we come to our last presentation. And fortunately, it's human resources. And for all the problems you've heard, AJ and Shauna have the answers. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Wow, big choice, super choice of college. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so good evening, Council. Um, I'd like to introduce Shauna Thomas. She's our HR analyst. Also um, known as Michael's punching bag. <laughs> <laughs> For her basketball selections. Basketball. Um, and uh, we, I also have a, a part-time limited-term HR generalist, uh, Betsy Dunn. Hi, Betsy. She's joining us from home. <laughs> Okay, so human resources, last but definitely not least. Um, in the simplest terms, um, my department's primary function is managing the employee's life cycle within our organization. Um, we're responsible really for our most valuable asset, which obviously is our staff. We've, you know, I'm always amazed um, when I'm in these meetings and I hear our, um, my coworkers talk about the things that they do, how incredibly talented the people are that I work with. So I'm really grateful every day that I get to show up and work with you guys. Um, when I first arrived here at the city, the service delivery model for HR was really uh, decentralized. Most of the HR functions was kind of left to the department, really. Um, since I've came on board and been able to bring on Shauna and Betsy, I, we now have a multi-tiered approach that basically uh, centralizes and decentralizes various processes. And really beyond the day-to-day -day operations and the transactional processes that have to take place just to you know, perform your, your standard HR processes, um, HR really has become a strategic business partner. 
Um, and really what that means is that a lot of times our partners from other departments, they're not only relying on us for like HR expertise, but they're inviting us to the table um, to help assist with integrating their business objectives with, with people management. So that I've been really fortunate with that. So primary functions, recruitment and retention, uh, compensation and benefits, um, our human resources information system, the administration of that, uh, performance management, employee relations, labor relations, training and development, risk management in conjunction with um, Shannon and Bonnie, and employment law and legal compliance, and policy formulation. Um, as of yesterday, two days ago? Two days ago, thank you. <laughs> uh, we had 177 active employees, so one more since Michelle has processed payroll. Um, 79 of those staff members are non-represented, 56 are represented currently by two uh, union groups, our police guild and our Teamsters. We have eight staff members that are pending representation, our police support group. We have four limited term. We have 29 extra hire, um, but based on the math that I did from uh, Scott, Ashley and Kyle's slides, it sounds like we need 84 <laughs> extra hires. <laughs> so that's, a, I mean, it, it's, that's an incredible gap. And we have, uh, as of March 1st, we had nine FTE vacancies, but four of those are gonna be filled soon. Sounds like we have some courts, so that number is gonna be coming down. I think the most important part um, about that portion of our slide is that basically from the HR perspective, our staff is 174 people. <laughs> um, our staff's comprised of me, the HR director, my HR analyst, and then of course, as I mentioned, Betsy Dunn, our HR um, generalist. Thank you, next slide. So uh, challenges in HR is citywide challenges always. <laughs> They're not just unique to me. We've heard a lot about that. Recruitment continues to be an issue. Our labor talent shortage. Um, there's more job competitors out there. Um, we're a full service city, which what that means is that a lot of the services that we offer at this city um, for a city of our size is very unique. So the people or the other jurisdictions or cities of our same size, um, we're not always competing for the same people in the same playing field. For example, take the court. Um, not all cities of our same size have a court. So for them, their job competitors are Renton, Federal Way, King County. So we're always having to uh, be innovative and creative about how we're addressing our solutions. Uh, let's see, economic uncertainty, retention, of course. Um, we're having a, a problem with bringing people in, but of course we also wanna focus on the staff that we have here. We want people to come and stay. Um, Part of the issue with retention, again, is more job opportunities within labor market. Uh, we need to ensure that we're, ma we're maintaining competitive salary and benefits, economic factors, and then, of course, employee burnout. Um, succession planning, uh, we want to, you know, through att attrition, we want to be able to identify and address and get ahead of that. We don't want people to leave before we have plans in place, if we can. Um, the management of our talent, and we want to ensure when we're doing succession planning that is equitable implementation. And then of course, technology. Um, we've since implemented the new Munis system, so we're still learning that. As Jeff mentioned, um, we are in, in accounting, they're starting to look at some of the other modules in Munis, that's the same in HR. Um, now that we've gotten payroll implemented, we wanna start rolling out some of the other features in our Munis system to hopefully improve the experience for our staff. Uh, we, because of that, we still have a bunch of manual processes, and then of course, paper-based transactions. So, you know, regardless of all of the challenges that we have, the environment is the environment, and the community still relies on us to provide services that meet their needs. So we're constantly <laughs> being challenged to create capacity through innovation, efficiency, and technology in an environment of finite resources. So, um, and in HR, we view challenges as opportunities, and you'll see here, um, this may look familiar to some of you from the budget retreat, um, you'll see a number of proposed or in the work strategies that have been identified and or deployed to leverage the playing field and hopefully remove as many barriers from success as possible. Um, I do wanna again highlight while recruitment continues to be a challenging area, um, we have not lost focus of retention for the staff that are here. Uh, Jeff mentioned earlier um, a partner, uh, we partnered with his department in building career um, progression tracks so basically, uh, a city of our size, we only have a limited amount of seats for upward mobility. 
but we were able to create career progression tracks where um, staff were able to um, advance. So we had like Jackson Swaggart went from our staff account to our senior account. So as they gain technical expertise, they can have increased responsibility. And then of course the compensation follows. I think that's an important message to our staff that we're invested in them and that we want them to stay here. Um, some things, uh, let's see what I'm to highlight here. Uh, succession planning, like I said, we want to get ahead. You, we don't, you don't want to do succession planning after people left, so some of that um, involves doing some reporting and analysis, our higher heads program in the PD, leadership development, technical training, a lot of cross-functional training opportunities. Um, I spoke about the career development training paths and then internships, which um, is starting out primarily with Ashley, so that's pretty exciting. Um, leveraging technology, because uh, as we all know, you are your tools <laughs> are exactly what can improve your experience um, while you're at work. So um, implementing all of the software um, system capability that we have, um, allowing employees to utilize self-service, Zoom, DocuSign, online forms, and interactive training platforms. Okay. So this is our 2023 work plan. I will say it's really ambitious. <laughs> um, and you'll see that many of the items that are identified here are, as priorities are really designed to bolster our efforts to combat the challenges and to remain competitive, um, nimble, and flexible. But we're not magicians, unfortunately, and our ability to deploy these strategies in HR is also gonna be dependent on my staffing and what other areas need tending to within the city. We do a lot of just-in-time um, sort of HR consulting <laughs> with, our, with our business partners. So this plan is doable, but there you know, are a number of factors that are out of our control. So under recruitment and retention, we wanna document our standard operating procedures uh, we want to continue to enhance, make enhancements in our recruitment and onboard modules. Um, under compensation and benefits, we want to complete the classification and compensation project we have open. That's been um, almost a year at this point. Um, under our HRS administration, which is um, with the implementation of MUNIS is a new function that HR has. I'm happy about it, but it has um, uh, taken uh, some of our bandwidth and our focus. But in there, we want to start to develop and implement the online workflow for personnel actions. Uh, we need electronic personnel files. <laughs> we want to develop and implement our training and certification modules and implement the leave administration within Munis. So when you, anytime you think about a software program, develop and implement are really nice words, but really what that involves is learning the system, getting with the stakeholders, <laughs> and then working with IT um, to help us build within the system and testing. So, I just want to point out that it's a big project. <laughs> uh, for performance management, we want to, it's maybe a little bit redundant, but right now we have a paper process. We'd like to make that, um, take that process online for better tracking. Employee relations, we're working on a more robust orientation process. Um, we've discussed for new, uh, new hires, maybe creating and pairing them with more tenured and seasoned employees. Um, getting past sort of like welcome to the city, here's your benefits, and turning people over to the department. So we want to stay in better contact and make sure that we're integrating people into our culture. Uh, labor relations, uh, updating and implementing the changes from the recently settled guild agreement and the Teamsters contract, which they ratified yesterday, which is still pending approval from city council. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, next month we'll begin negotiating the new police support collective bargaining agreement. For training and development, um, we've started this. We want to finalize our career progression and training path. So what we've done is start to identify by positions, in other words, for like supervisory and managerial position, what skill set can we help the managers develop so they have things in their toolkit to help them be more successful and empower them. And then, of course, continue to look for opportunities where we can create career ladder progressions. Uh, risk management, that's in conjunction with Shannon revamp the accident prevention plan and the safety committee. Uh, employment law, we want to, we will uh, be providing uh, required citywide compliance training such as workplace harassment. We're due for that this year. And then this one <laughs> that's been chasing me around since I got here <laughs> is adopt the latest draft of the city of Des Moines personnel manual. So. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and <see. laughs> so, 
AJ and Shauna, thank you for that. And council, I just want to say, um, even though I've, you know, we went through these and kind of organized it in the manner in which it was presented, it's, it's striking to me. And if I was not the city manager, I would have the same level of pride in the dynamism and accomplishments of your staff. So thank you, everyone. Mayor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Before I go for a quick round be uh, through our council members, uh, could you uh, just give us the takeaways you'd like us to come back on the April 6th meeting? Um, I think I'm going to use AJ's term, tiny amount of bandwidth. Um, so so uh, what I think is important, and, and this is you know discussion to have, is if there are specific types of projects or projects or areas of the city or aspects of infrastructure or whatever it is any particular council member may feel is important to address, we'd like to hear that. And then we would like to respond to that based in the context of what you saw tonight. And then we would, we would ask for direction from council if it's a priority that you want to implement within the work plans that you've seen. And, and for that to happen, I think it's fair to say something's got to drop off or something's got to be delayed or something has to become a, less of a priority as compared to what it is you want to accomplish. So we're perfectly open to hearing anything that you feel should get done and four votes to do it and a discussion about what else, where does it fit? In the, in the overall context of what you saw tonight. That's the discussion we'd like to have. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're gonna go, we're gonna go down the line. I'll start with uh, Council Member Nutting and work this way, then I'll hit these guys and then I'll close up. Go ahead, you have the floor. Great presentation, that's all I have, thank you. Council Member Oxiger. Thank you for the presentation. Council Member Nutt Pennington. We often get confused because yeah, our, our yeah. beards are, are pretty similar. <laughs> um, it was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. Um, there's a lot there. It, 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 I think, you know, I mean, we went over tonight, and, and I'm glad that we did because it really put it into, into the whole thing into context, not only for council, but, you know, for um, probably everybody who's watching and, and, it, and, you know, and even yourselves. I mean, you guys know what you do in your divisions, but... You know, it's part of that that open communication, so everybody understands it, and that there's conflicting uh, priorities or competing priorities. Maybe not conflicting, but competing, and where we do that. Um, and Shannon, um, you started right in COVID, so the 97 percent. Well, just before, right? And and um, so it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, Councilmember Harris. Thank you for your time. Mayor Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. Thank all of you. This is a long night. You guys did great in your presentations. I really appreciate all your work and bringing it all to us. Thank you. Councilmember Steinmetz. And I just want to say thank you very much. My brain is full. Uh, and uh, I hope that this will be available. Uh, the all the PowerPoint slides that will be available to us. That would be very useful. Thank you. Yeah, I think good job. Excellent job. Mm -hmm. Anyways. And I'd, I'd like to close up. I just thank you all for your long standing. Getting it all done in one night's important to set up the next meeting. Uh, I forget sometimes how hard you all work. I, I know it, but you also, it's a great reminder tonight. I can tell there was a lot of thought and depth in your reporting, and I, that's why I wanted to ensure that each of you got your moment. You all shined, and I'm grateful for that. And uh, the next meeting for council will be a regular council meeting on March 9th at 6 p.m. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Move for move. I think I've got like eight of them and <laughs> the seven council members. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.